podcasting to keep all the members in the spotlight for the next four items and give everyone a warm welcome to this education committee. And are members aware of any apologies? Yeah, Chair, uh, just on behalf of uh, my party colleague, Justin McNulty, it is off uh, today with good news. His wife gave birth to their first son uh, late last night, so he's uh, ecstatic, to put it mildly. Uh, I, I said there's a future generation of the SDLP coming through, and he says a future GA player, so even even in birth. <laughs> um, Daniel, it makes genuinely, would, would you extend the sincere congratulations of the entire committee to uh, to him and his wife uh, and I'm sure we'll be able to do that uh, soon enough in person as well. Um, that's that's uh, great news for him and the family. I, I, I think it was Justin who proposed the, the youth engagement uh, session that we're taking today, so we'll be sure to send him uh, a, a gift of the Hansard of our session today uh, to, keep him, to, keep him, to keep him occupied, uh, perhaps when he's got a few additional hours during the yeah. nights over the next week or so. Uh, but make, make sure... Make sure you extend our, our warm congratulations to him. Thanks for that, you, Sam. Any other apologies, members? Nope. Okay. Agenda item two is chairperson's business. Can I refer members to a response from the department on issues arising from the ministerial briefing on the 23rd of March at page five of your meeting packs? The correspondence details funding underpinning the Young People's Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework and for the Engage program. Members may wish to uh, scrutinise the detail of this with officials in our budget briefing this morning. Um, the letter uh, notes a, a £5 million pressure bid has been made to support further delivery um, and Engage School funding is on the department's website and is broken down every primary and post-primary school for the period March 20 to September 21 and further from April 21 to June 21 according to the number of full-time equivalent pupils enrolled and whether uh, pupils are in type of free school meals is less than or greater than 28 percent that's an issue we've raised before the department's letter today clarifies that the education authority will allocate the additional April to June funding to direct to schools as COVID funding. Okay, members. I've also come up with a draft wording for a restraint and seclusion motion, and it's tabled today. Uh, members be content to consider the wording of the motion and to agree it at next week's meeting. That'd be appropriate. Yes, please, Chair. I, I, I agree and or amend, obviously. Sorry, very presumptuous of me that you'll agree entirely with all of my text. But hopefully it, it, it is that the wording of the motion it is extremely close to the wording of a motion that was previously agreed by, uh, all, I think, all parties in the Assembly. So hopefully it, it should be um, straightforward. But if you, if you can consider that, and we'll agree that it, hopefully at, at next week's committee meeting and then for consideration of the business committee to get that onto the order paper as, as soon as possible. Thank you. Members, the Minister has communicated that he will not be available before the 19th of May. Uh, the committee had obviously uh, requested that he attend the committee sooner than that. Our members um, say contempt, acceptance of uh, the fact that this uh, is the date that the Minister is offering and that at that meeting we'll wish to uh, raise issues of implementation of the SIA uh, alternative assessment system uh, and the contingency plans and communication plans to assist teacher in preparation for next year's pupil exams uh, and the, uh, amongst a, a, a wide range of other issues. Anyone wish to come in on that or? Will yeah, sure. Yes, Robert. Yeah, I'm kind of disappointed to be honest, and then you know, don't do the, the, the stamp on the public type stuff. I think that's four weeks away, given the um, on, uh, I mean, what we said, the uncertainty and the level of fear that's built within the students that are sitting these exams. Um, genuinely wish he, he could have uh, came a wee bit sooner. I mean, that's still that's four weeks away from now. Um, I think the letter probably went a couple of weeks ago, seeing if he could move it a wee bit earlier. Um, I mean, the minister can do what he wants to do, but it is, it is disappointing. Yep, I would agree. Uh, and perhaps.
jobs, we do all we can to ensure that we facilitate as much time with them as possible on that particular occasion. Uh, but um, aside, aside using statutory powers to call him earlier than that, which seems slightly disproportionate, um, the, the minister has been unwilling to uh, accept our request to attend the committee sooner than uh, four weeks away. Uh, any other members wish to comment before we move on? Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. I think this is very, very important. Uh, you know, lessons have to have been learned from what happened last year. I think members across this committee will uh, agree that we cannot have a repeat uh, of the upset and annoyance that was caused. And it's important that we are ahead of the ball um, on this. I, I do think it's appropriate we try and force to some degree with pressure. See you before the committee uh, to question them uh, on. Uh, uh, what they have in place and basically concerns that have been raised with, I'm sure, many members of this committee to date. I'm not sure when the, the, the current chief executive is due to go, but it's uh, uh, gone probably. I think we need to, to have say before us at the earliest convenience. Yeah, um, I think there's a wide range of issues there, Daniel. Clark, am I right in saying that an interim chief executive announcement has been made? Just checking that, that that's public and I'm permitted to refer to that. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the um, correspondence as well, and um, a uh, lady named Margaret. Margaret. Yeah, yeah. Margaret's yeah. replaced. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, perhaps on their forward work program, we can consider how we schedule the uh, ministerial briefing and, and the CA briefing. I mean, members, you have concerns around um, assessment, the uh, appeal process, um, mental health. Um, what is going to be in place for year 11 and year 13 next year, what's going to be in place for transfer for P7 next year. I'm receiving quite a bit of correspondence with regards to concerns about um, study leave uh, for people. So I'm not sure if other members are being contacted about that, uh, but yeah, quite, quite a bit of correspondence that after these assessments, many people are being released for study leave uh, despite um, the significant amount of remote learning that would have taken place this year already. So there's a wide range of issues that we we'll want to raise with the Minister and the clock is ticking on this uh, term. Um, so we need to get him uh, in as soon as possible and to make sure we have as much time with him as possible. We can set it up before we the program. Okay, members. Um, uh, Chair, can we just raise a... Uh, just oh, Sorry, Robin, let me, let me in your thing there. Uh, members, could you maybe mute yourselves and uh, make sure background noise is cut out? Um, that'd be great. Okay, or if Assembly Broadcasting could just bring Robin into the spotlight alone. That might be helpful. Robin? Yeah, sure. Uh, the finance minister uh, updated us uh, yesterday on the 28.3 million that was being made available to the Department of Education for the uh, return to school and the support to emotional health and well-being of, of our young people, uh, pupils, uh, and indeed I think probably wider than just pupils. I think that's, that's an issue that I think there's general agreement in the committee that uh, we do need to support uh, our, our young people beyond this uh, sort of academic year and into the summer months. Uh, perhaps uh, on the agenda for the minister's visit, we could maybe raise with the minister how that money is going to be allocated, the purpose of it, uh, the, the spend timeline on it. Um, uh, and as we know, uh, it's been reported to us that we're expecting a 20% increase in the mental health issues. Uh, I think this 28 million probably is a step, a uh, very positive step uh, in, in the right direction. But indeed, that uh, we'd like to see maybe a, a continuance of support in, into the next ac academic year, Chair. Yeah, that's certainly valid points, Robin. Um, we can... Um, Ask maybe some of those questions this morning uh, to the uh, officials in relation to the budget, but absolutely, um, 
be good to raise those with the minister as well when he's with us. Thanks for that, Robin. Um, okay, Clark, um, we've just been reminded prior to uh, starting the, the meeting in public session that there is a, a minute silence for International Workers' Day at 11 a.m. today. Is it is it possible in the course of our committee to, um, to respect that minute silence? Yeah, I'll keep an eye out and I'll set an alarm. We'll okay, that. thanks. Thanks, Dad. Can members content with that? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, members. Okay, agenda item three, members, is draft minutes. Can I refer you to the draft minutes of our meeting on the 21st of April at page 12 of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? So agreed? Agreed, members? Yeah. Agreed, Chair. Thank you, Rob. Okay. Agenda uh, item four is matters arising. I have no matters arising. And that takes us to agenda item five then, our Department of Education briefing on the budget for 2021 to 22. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all the members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to the clerk's brief in table papers? Uh, the Department of Education business plan in tabled papers um, that was received um, yesterday, late yesterday, Evie, is that right, Clark? It came over during the day yesterday. During the day, yeah. Okay, so it, it has been a short amount of time to try and consider some of these submissions in detail, and we may need to return to them at a later date. Um, the Department of Education uh, business plan end of year monitoring final position at the 31st of March at page 21. The Department of Education opening resource budget at page 75. Comparison of capital budget outturn against the 21 22 opening capital position at page 78. And 21 to 22 budget education distribution table at page 82. Can I welcome Gary Fair, the Director of Finance at the Department of Education, Neil Palmer, Head of Budgeting Team, Department of Education, Philip Irwin, Director of Investment and Infrastructure at the Department of Education, and advise officials that the committee will give you approximately 10 minutes to make your opening statement, followed by questions. Over to you, Gary. Thank you. Can I just Thank check you again? Just check, you can hear me okay? We can, thank you. Yes, great. Thank you very much for having us along this morning. Um, my plan was to cover the resource budget, first of all, and then to take any questions, and then to pass over to Philip to cover the capital budget. So if you're content, we'll adopt that approach. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Um, if I can refer members to the information that we provided, the budget distribution table, you'll see a heading total non ring fenced resource budget Sorry, for this I'll, year. I'll maybe just make sure that I refer members to the pages for the documents yes, to yes. which you're referring. So the budget education distribution table is at page 82 of members' packs. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Within that table, um, there's a heading total non ring fenced resource budget for this year of 2322.8. So I just wanted to start by providing a bit of context to this. Um, that to get to that 2322 figure, I have to make it clear that the minister is over committing on his budget at the start of this year, but it's on the basis that we have been given commitments by the finance minister that, that we will receive certain amounts, um, hopefully at June monitoring that we'll be given priority. So we're over committing, <clears throat> department's over committing by 81.2 million. Uh, now that covers the confidence and supply money of 16 and a half million, which has never been baseline. So every year we've had to ensure that we, we get that. Last year we got it in year as well, but again, with a commitment that we would get it in year. There's 35 million we're anticipating getting to cover the new teachers pay settlement for the 2019 and 2020 years. Uh, 1.4 million for Bright Start, which is normally bid for by uh, the NIO, I think it is. Yes. yes, but this year it was bid for by ourselves. That's our share of that budget. And then uh, 28 
1.3 million that was referred to earlier by a member for COVID money. Uh, so if I can just start, our, our actual baseline position is 2345.1. Now included within that are two elements relating to COVID money. That's 30.6 million for holiday food scheme. And you will see all of anything that I referred to in terms of COVID will be in the long COVID list that you've been given. So there's 30.6 30 and 44.4 that we've been given and baselined at this point in time. So if we take those off, just so as we're looking at the, if you like, the normal money as opposed to the COVID money, that brings it down to 2270.1. Then if we add on these other three amounts that I've referred to that we have, the finance minister has given a commitment once the Secretary of State signs them off, that we will get them in year, the 16 and a half, the 1.4 and the 35. That brings us to the 2322.9 figure that you can see in your table. Now, that that leaves us in terms of normal general pressures and then DNA pressures. We're car still carrying about 145 million into this year, which will have to be kept under review as the year progresses. So we'll be looking at it as, as we normally do. We'll be looking at, at those pressures and potentially bidding in year for additional resources, depending on how things pan out. I should say by way of context that last year, as you, as you, you know, you don't need me to tell you was an extremely unusual year. And because there was so much money additional, additionally allocated to address the COVID issues, it actually helped the sector overall in that year. But I suppose the, the thing I would emphasize is that the underlying financial issues across the sector still remain. And I would just stress that to the committee. So that's why I do stress that we're still carrying 145 million pressures, which we will keep under review. But the minister has made his decisions based on the envelope, budget envelope that he's been provided with. In terms of the COVID-19 related money, uh, we have, as I've said, we've already been allocated 44.4 million in our baseline and a 30.6 million for the holiday food scheme. And we have been we've got the commit commitment that we'll get the 28.3 million referred to earlier. So that's a total of 103.3 million COVID related money that is that, that we will be getting for this year. That leaves an unmet pressure at this stage of 29 million COVID related. And uh, now again, that will be kept under review and we anticipate that there will be other opportunities, perhaps again this year outside the, the normal monitoring arrangements to bid for additional COVID money. It can be difficult to estimate exactly what's required for some of these funds. And, and we find that last year at times we had to give up certain amounts and bid for different amounts because they're generally, generally allocated in a ring fenced way. So it was only in the last quarter of last year that the minister had the opportunity to move money around within the overall COVID heading because it was coming so close to the end of the year. But at this stage in the year, they are allocated for specific purposes and the Education Authority and schools will have to monitor the spend against those particular headings. So we will keep that under review as the year progresses. Um, so in terms of the aggregated schools budget, the money going out to schools, you're probably aware that uh, my letter issued to schools Friday week ago, got it out as quickly as it could, just so as, uh, schools can begin to plan as early as possible. Uh, and obviously last year there was a delay in getting school financial plans agreed because of all that was going on and to be fair on schools and the education authority there was a lot of extra work in terms of the monitoring of spend against the very specific COVID related funding pots. So the opening position of the ASB just to, to explain how we got to the figure of 1377.7 that you will see in the table provided. The opening position for last year was 133.7. 4.5. Now we had to take out an amount and a non-recurring teachers pay element that was allocated last year to address the previous teachers pay arrears last year. So we took off 51.9 million. And then for this year, for this year, we were, we have provided additional money to cover teaching and non-teaching pay pressures uh, to help to mitigate those pressures throughout the year. 75.9 for teaching and 2.5 for non-teaching. And as well as that, an amount was put in of 16.7 million to ensure that the cash value of the average 
weighted pupil unit is kept the same across both phases, nursery and primary and post-primary. If we hadn't done that, there was the risk because of the demographics that post-primary could have lost out and at individual school level that can have quite an impact. So the same situation occurred for last year. Additional money was put in just to try and keep that balance and to avoid a detrimental impact at school level. So that brings us to the, the figure of 1377.7. So leaving aside the non-recurring element that I referred to, 51.9, it actually represents an increase of about 95 million for schools this year. So the Minister has, uh, as always, tried to get as much out directly to schools as possible. And then in terms of the EA block grant, I'm just picking out these two areas just to, to explain how we have got to the figures. The block grant position, the EA block grant position for this year is 70.2 as shown in the table. And just to explain how we got to that position, the 2021 opening position was 715.5. Uh, there had been SEN funding held in 2021 of 20 million. So we're taking that off because that was specifically relating to last year. And then there was an additional 10.5 allocated for COVID-19 money to the block grant last year. So we're taking that off. And then the non-recurring element of the te previous teacher's pay agreement of 6.8 million. And then the Education Authority also gets benefits from the additional money for to cover, to help to mitigate the pay, previous pay agreements, teachers' pay agreements and non-teaching contractual arrangements. So that's 10.7 to cover teaching and 3.8 to cover non-teaching. And then there's an, an amount has been allocated for SEN special education needs of 12.5 million. So that results in a figure of 705.1. So that was just to explain, because you'll see from the table, it looks like a drop in block grant allocation, but there are a number of factors involved in getting to that position. Now, the Education Authority is still identifying pressures of about 42 million for this year. So as was the case last year and probably in a number of previous years, we will keep that under review. We, we obviously meet regularly with the Education Authority, engage closely with them on their pressures. And um, we'll just have to keep an eye on that and we will potentially be bidding for additional resources in year. But our, our focus, certainly for the first monitoring round, will be in ensuring that we get the amounts that have been committed to the department, those three areas that were referred to earlier. So that's just by way of introduction, because obviously we've thrown a lot of figures at you in the distribution table, but that's the context. So I'm happy to take any <coughs> questions at that point. OK, thanks for that, Gary. Um, I'll bring members in straight away at this point, given the tight schedule that we have today. And um, I think we'll go straight to Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, the, according to the figures, the Education Authority is getting seven hundred and five million, and we're all aware of the recent audit office report that told us that neither EA or D DE could demonstrate value for money uh, when it came to special educational needs provision. Now, what's important here is the education of children with special educational needs. So can you explain what measures have been taken to ensure accountability uh, and that the Education Authority and the Department will be able to demonstrate value for money when it comes to expenditure on special educational needs? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I can't comment specifically on that area. I mean, that is quite, it's a big area that is being taken forward at the moment by the Education Authority, and there will be ongoing engagement with the department in that respect. Uh, our norm, my normal engagement with colleagues in the Education Authority does crawl over the detail and discuss in detail how money is being spent and you know the outcomes being delivered as a result of that expenditure. That's part of our ongoing uh, financial challenge, if you like, and financial engagement with the Education Authority. But the whole special education needs is, is very specific, and I, and I wouldn't want to comment on any detail on that. Obviously, other colleagues will, will know more about that. And it's possibly not the right point in time to, to maybe report an awful lot at this stage. I don't know. I just don't want to step on territory that I'm, that I'm not directly involved in. But certainly from a normal spend point of view, we will continue 
that robust engagement with the education authority and special education needs expenditure will be covered within that. And are, are you telling me, therefore, that you're not aware of any measures uh, have been put in place in the aftermath of the audit office report to ensure that there is value for money in SEND provision? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that uh, I, I wouldn't want to get into the detail of that because it's it's not there. There's there are other colleagues that are more close to the detail that may be able to provide you with more information on that at the appropriate time. I know that there is an, a lot being taken forward. I just wouldn't want to comment on the detail because I wouldn't be as closely involved. Well, why is this not the appropriate time? I mean, the audit office report has been out for quite a while now. Well, I was asked to, uh, to update the committee on, on the budget generally. Uh, I can obviously comment on individual areas to a certain extent, but they're not my areas of specialism. Okay, well, can, can you arrange for someone to uh, send information to the committee about what measures have been put in place to ensure there is uh, accountability in terms of value for money? Uh, in regard to provision of special educational needs? Yes, we'll do that. Okay. Uh, the, um, all, all the credible, uh, just to move on, all the, all the credible academic research shows that the early years are crucial in a, in a child's development. Uh, and, I mean, unfortunately, the funding model here actually devotes more funding to post-primary, the post-primary sector rather than uh, early years and the primary sector. Uh, has there been any uh, change in, in how that funding model is going to be, uh, uh, is, is going to be driven forward? And it's interesting that in the debate in the Assembly on Monday uh, around academic selection uh, and in the course of that debate it came up about the long tail of underachievement. The minister himself uh, said that uh, more funding in early years was one of the responses to that long tail of underachievement. So could you comment on that? Thanks. Okay. Uh, maybe pick up your last point. First of all, um, obviously the, the review and to underachievement will be taken forward in due course. So again, that would probably be looking at aspects that you're referring to. And in terms, I think what you're possibly referring to generally is the talk in the past, there has been of a review of the common funding scheme, including the way money is allocated to schools through the common funding formula. That, um, that review was put on hold really at this about a year ago at the start of the pandemic because there just wasn't the capacity to take it further at that point in time. Uh, I think once we reach a more business as usual point, the minister may well decide then to, to you know, bring that to the fore again and consider at some point going out to consult on potential changes to the way money is allocated across the sector, you know, right across from nursery, primary, post-primary. Uh, you referred to more money potentially going into the post-primary sector. I mean, obviously, to some extent, that reflects the nature of post-primary, where there are a, a, there's a bigger range of subjects having to be delivered, which does require more money, more resourcing to actually deliver those. That That's one aspect, obviously. But in terms of a general view of the funding formula, that's not being taken forward at the moment, but it hopefully will be picked up again at some point. Uh, when we reach a more business as usual point. So, so you're, you're saying currently that there are no plans to change the balance in funding between the early years in primary uh, versus the uh, post-primary sector? Is that, is that what you're saying to me? I'm saying there's no plan to, to, to make significant changes to the way that money goes out to schools does, will in, in due course require public consultation. Those changes can't just be made willy-nilly. Um, I did refer, when I was just giving the context, that the Minister has allocated 16.7 million to ensure that the share going to the respective phases, post nursery, and primary, and post-primary, is kept more or less the same as in previous years. Now, the big difference this year 
is the impact of COVID-19 and the lack of exams last year and the impact that's having on increasing numbers going on to sixth form classes. So there's a number of factors at play there, but the Minister has taken action to at least ensure that neither sector is, is uh, detrimentally affected. Okay. okay. And, I, and, I, and I understand. Just to, just to come in briefly, I, I'm going to have to keep us really prompt today due to the schedule. Apologies. So if you could ask a final ten question, seconds, that's okay. Ten, yeah, ten seconds, Chair. Um, just that um, I, I understand the need for consultation and so on, but I also uh, believe there's a need for proper planning. And from what I'm hearing today is that there are no plans to rebalance the budget. And just to yourself, Chair, I mean, you heard the Minister in the Chamber on Monday saying that there was a need for greater funding into early years uh, as one of the tools to fight against this long tail of underachievement. And it would appear there are no plans there at all to do anything. So uh, that's I all I have. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, I, I, think, I think those are important points. I, I supplement them very briefly rather than take my own questions. Um, Gary, the, the Deputy Chair has picked up on an important point here, um, and you're, you're trying your best to be as diplomatic and positive about this as possible, but the Education Minister has confirmed that the Education Transformation Programme initiative has been closed, and that includes the Common Funding Formula Review that would, I presume, be essential to the type of rebalancing to which Pat has referred, and as Pat says, the Education Minister has referred. So surely that's counterintuitive. Um, I'm not going to ask you why he's closed the Education Transformation Programme, but you can tell me this. How, how long had you been working on the Common Funding Formula Review as part of the Education Transformation Programme? Uh, from memory, I think it was about a year and a half. Are you sure it's only a year and a half? And no, I can't remember exactly. A year and a half to two years, that was my involvement from memory. Okay, I, so I, I, there's again, at, least, at least two years worth of work on a con common funding formula review that the Education Minister has closed without, I come, without as much as an interim report or a, a, a feedback, a briefing. Uh, perhaps if I can just clarify, when the Minister has referred to the Transformation Programme having been closed, that was out of necessity because there was only a limited number of resources within the Department and the pressure that everybody has been under since the pandemic struck has had to be managed and other, you know, we, 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 have, we have also taken forward other things that are not just business as usual. So I, I don't believe that it's the Minister's intention necessarily to, to never pick this up again. And certainly the work that has been I, I, done. Those are, guys, those, are, those, are, those are two different things. You know, never, you know, not intending to never pick it up again and knowing if and when it's going to be picked up again. Or, or indeed, I'm trying to be fair, you know, was, was two years worth of work not worth some sort of interim report or indication or some sort of feedback around this issue? What, what, uh, did you, what did you find in your two years of work in relation to the common funding formula? Well, we had, we had looked at various areas over that period of time and, and had pulled together material for the Minister to consider. So we were at the point, really, of sharing stuff with the Minister back in March last year, and it was just timing that went against that. Uh, the work has not been wasted, and we engaged closely with colleagues across the sector and took their views. Obviously, we had to handle it in a way. It wasn't a public consultation that we were doing at that stage, so we had to handle it carefully, but we did engage with a wide range of stakeholders. So a lot of that work, that, that's not wasted work. Yes, if it was picked up again at some point in the near future, it would probably have to be refreshed, but it's not wasted time by any means. Um, okay. okay. Now, one, okay. one point I would make is really <clears throat> to make any significant changes to the way that money is allocated to the school via the formula, invariably would require additional resources and that's one of the challenges the minister has you know he he will obviously he's obviously endeavored to allocate as much as he can to each of the sectors to to honor his views on that but he has a limited budget envelope to work with him okay i'll, I'll keep this moving thanks guy can i bring yeah. in robin newton mla please thanks Thanks, Ron. You might need to unmute yourself there. The uh, 
spotlight doesn't always do that. Is your device muted, Robin? It won't. Uh, That's you. That's you, Robin. There you go. Good man. Thanks. I don't know what happened there, Chair. It wouldn't unmute uh, for me. No Can I thank Gary and his, his team uh, for, for being here? My, I've only perhaps uh, two fairly simple uh, questions. Uh, and we made reference to the 28 million um, under the COVID regulations that were allocated by the finance minister to the department on on Monday or Tuesday, whichever day that was. Um, but, uh, yeah, Gary, you could outline how the expenditure of, of that will take place and what the kind of timeline it is for it. And then on the other side, obviously, we're, the whole of the committee has been supportive of the holiday hunger uh, issue. Um, and you have 30.6 allocated to that. Um, perhaps again, you could outline how the expenditure on that will be carried out, and again, what timelines we're working for. Okay, I'll just pass over to Neil. Comment on that. Thank you. Yes, with regards to the twenty-eight point three million uh, that was allocated specifically um, for certain programs, so uh, seventeen million was allocated for Engage Two, so that's to run a second Engage program starting September twenty twenty-one. So that's for the next academic year. Um, there was four, five million allocated for youth summer schemes, which will be run this summer. Um, four million allocated for schools summer schemes, which will be run this summer, um, and an additional two point three million to expand Sure Start provision. So that should total the twenty eight point three million. Um, and the the summer scheme plans uh, do also include special schools at this stage. And I think we're, there's. Uh, the specific team are looking at trying to expand that slightly as well beyond the usual uh, special schools summer schemes. And the reason, uh, just to point out the reason that uh, we got the commitment from the finance minister to get that at a later point was because we stressed the urgency of, of kicking a lot of this off at an early stage. Policy colleagues want to get things in place, so they've already been working at that to try and get the arrangements in place at an early stage. Well, that that sounds to me to be very positive. Uh, yeah, and obviously getting it kicked off. I think we're all concerned about the pupils and young people as we yeah. return to school and, and indeed work in towards the next uh, academic year over over the summer months. Can you give me any more detail on the schools summer schemes? Can you do you have any detail on that area? How that might operate? Is that maybe outside your remit? I'm not sure that we have an awful lot more detail other than the general principle that it's really to try and it's just to give that facility to young people to engage with one another on a variety of activities and to get them re-engaging generally on uh, various yeah. educational aspects. Yeah, I couldn't. I, I don't have much more information on that, sorry. Okay, well, well done on the bid. Uh, that, that's a significant amount of money uh, coming in to address those uh, important issues. Uh, around the holiday hunger then, could you talk, talk me through the holiday hunger one? Or talk to the committee through the holiday hunger one? Yeah, the, the 30.6 million um, has been secured uh, pretty much to cover uh, all of the holiday periods uh, for the next for, for the rest of this financial year. So it'll cover the summer months, it'll cover Halloween, Christmas, and the element of Easter that falls into this financial year. Um, that, well, that's really all I have, is that it fully covers uh, meal provision now during holiday periods. Okay. Okay, well, that, that, that's that's good. And again, another positive one addressing the issues. And I presume that would be tied in uh, with, I mean, much of it would be tied in with uh, those children who find it uh, difficult struggle at school and so on. So we're addressing at least in part yeah. or something here in part the underachievement uh, area. Yes, yeah, it's linked to the free school meal entitlement, which isn't a direct link, obviously, but it's the potential yeah. really to help on youngsters, yeah. Yeah. And obviously, yeah. and obviously that was an executive commitment, so we didn't have much, we had no hassle getting that funding. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Chair, that, that's that's me. I'm, I'm content. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, um, and thank you to our witnesses today for uh, from the department for the information so far. Uh, I have a number of questions, Gary, so I'll go straight into it, and, and you might need a pen to jot a few points down so I can get through this as swiftly as I can. But, um, page 48 of, of your document, Gary, uh, yeah. you're planning uh, an underspend uh, budget of around 1%. Just for the sake of clarity, uh, can you uh, explain precisely how much that amounts to? Okay. 1% is too be, be less than 20 million. 20, about 20, roughly about 20 million. 20 million? Yeah, is 1%. It's, it's roughly a 2 billion budget. 2 billion budget? Yeah. 1%. Right, okay. Okay. Uh, right, okay. That's great. I have a series of points then on that basis. What do you propose to do uh, with the underspend? Uh, will any of this money be handed back to the Department of Finance or the Treasury? And will any other DE monies be handed back uh, as well? Further to that, considering the significant cuts school budgets have had for over 10 years and the negative impact this has had on our children's education and well being, have you and the Department allocated any money to school budgets? And do you realize when schools and parents hear that uh, you've not spent your budget on uh, children, uh, they will be quite angry uh, that this money can't be rediverted? That's if it is going to be returned to the Treasury or the Department. And uh, so how could you finally flag up not spending the allocated resources as a green target, uh, something worthy of achieving, uh, maybe even a positive thing? And the final point on this is uh, you go on to uh, give uh, yourselves a green light uh, for the action of, uh, unquote, use uh, use funding to maximise uh, uh, the benefit to schools, which is on page 49 uh, uh, in your uh, comments section. You state, the impact on schools of lockdown restrictions introduced since Christmas 2020 has changed the risk faced by schools from the risk of schools overspending to the potential for an underspend, end of quote. Do you accept, Gary, that the underspend is not positive, uh, it is a negative one? Uh, and secondly, uh, that our children deserve the resources allocated uh, spent on them and their education. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're referring to last year, I presume. So yeah. the, the position, the year end position isn't yet known. It's still being finalized, particularly by the education authority. So they're working through all the figures. Uh, and I think what we're wanting to emphasize is that unusually this year, unlike pre the last number of years, it's likely to be, if anything, a small underspend position rather than an overspend position. Now, that, that has been a combination of factors. We, we have, uh, through the Education Authority and directly to schools, we have allocated uh, a significant amount of money right across the sector. Uh, we were successful, a lot of it we were successful in getting in year. So that money's been put out there, but the problem is it is ring pants. There is still accountability. It's taxpayers' money. So... We can't just throw money around the system and it had to be monitored against specific spending pots. Now, as I said earlier, the minister in the last quarter of last year did have some flexibility to uh, allow various COVID pots of money to be moved around to maximise the spend. That has all been done. So every effort has been made to ensure that as much as possible has gone out to schools. And there has been, as a result, a positive impact on a reduction in schools deficits for last year, although we don't have the figures yet because it's not finalised, and an increase in some school surpluses, which again, schools will have the, they will be entitled to draw down from those in the future. So every effort has been made to maximise the money going out to schools. The problem has been obviously with school closures and the more additional money going out, it has been a challenging year. You know, you can't, there still has to be a high degree of accountability around all spend. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gary, just a, a further point. The Minor Works Programme has been decimated from 84 million, I made this point at a previous meeting on this committee, uh, from 84 million in 2018 19 uh, to 46 million for 2021 22. So it's almost halved. Uh, considering the growing calls from schools in relation to the poor state of the existing school estate across Northern Ireland, I would have thought that the Department of Education would have been looking uh, for a substantial increase in funding, uh, not an almost 50% cut. 
how and or why has there been uh, such a severe cut, Gary? Secondly, how much did the department ask for in the first instance? Uh, and uh, what funding does DE estimate it needs to make substantial progress uh, with minor works if it had the choice uh, uh, of the level of funds in order to do so? Uh, Chair, do you want me to pass over to Philip at this point, or will we wait until Philip's covering yeah, capital? Yeah, yeah, there's a direct question there. Happy for a concise That's answer. Well. That's yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay, um, well, I suppose the first point to make um, is you're, you're comparing there the outturn of the past three years on on the table. I think, Chair, you said it was on page 78 of your um, your briefing pack. So th those figures there are showing that the minor works. Uh, initial allocation is significantly below the outturn of, of previous years, and, and that is true. Uh, and I suppose there are a couple of points to make in that. First of all, you know the the initial out or the initial allocation will not necessarily reflect where we are at the end of the year, um, as in the previous years that are shown there. The initial allocation to minor works would have been significantly lower than the outturn. The minor works is used as the balancing pot if if there is slippage in other areas or if we uh, or are successful in bids in year minor works are the area where we can uh, turn spend on relatively quickly um, and, and where we would apply that that spend um, so you'll see at the bottom of the table uh, we've already initiated a bid for additional an additional 14 million pounds for minor works uh, through the rri uh, borrowing uh, mechanism and we would intend as we go through the year that, well, A, if there's slippage in other areas, we would, would apply it to minor works. But B, when we have the opportunity at monitoring rounds, we will we will be putting in bids for uh, additional funding. And it's the minor works that that would go to because those are the projects you can turn on relatively quickly in that we have to spend the money in a year. Okay. And just a point, if you yeah, would like. Okay, th thank you uh, both for your answer so far. Uh, COVID-19 has taught us the importance of safe transport to and from school and the dangers of mixing pupils from a number of schools on one bus. And this has been a huge public concern. Considering the experts are telling us that our society will have to live with the effects of COVID-19 for some years into the future, has COVID-19 caused DE to rethink its transport policy in any way? And secondly, has DE any plans to seek additional funding for the procurement of new buses in the near future? And that's... Me, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'll pick up the first point. Um, I, I, in response, I would say that the EAS had to look at how they deal with the, the current unusual and exceptional circumstances in, in relation to school transport, whether or not they are reviewing their policy more generally. I couldn't comment on, but they've, they've obviously had to respond to the, the consequences of the pandemic and ensure that children are safe when they're being transported on school buses. I'll pass over to Philip. Uh, yeah, that. in terms of the investment, um, th there is a business case that was approved uh, earlier and uh, right back at the beginning of the financial year in relation to transport. Um, I think uh, it's an approved spend of something like £44 million pounds over a number of years. Uh, £13.5 million of that uh, has been invested in 2021. And uh, you'll see that again, going back to that table we were talking about uh, where there's an other capital line, a significant element of that is also um, uh, allocated towards transport uh, in year. Uh, now, the exact timing of that as to how much we'll go into this year and how much into the following year probably comes back to some of those other questions around pressures and minor works and so on, because as we go through the year, the, the allocations will move a little bit. But we have £44 million pounds investment approved uh, and you know that will be completed. I would suggest over the next couple of years. Yeah, the, the only reason I have that concern, Chair, is is because whilst mainstream schools were closed, obviously special schools remained open. Uh, and uh, during that period, uh, I know that children attending special uh, schools were spread across more buses. Obviously, with the return uh, and resumption of uh, education for all age groups, uh, that presents difficulties uh, for uh, uh, the, the previous action. So I'm just concerned that uh, quite a number of children are being mixed on buses from various schools, various age groups, and it just contradicts the guidance. And, and I'm wondering what the department has done to allocate further funds to avoid uh, uh, infection or risk off. Well, there has been an, an additional 1.3 million uh, allocated specifically to, to address the current 
issues. So uh, the Education Authority will be using that to try and ensure that they address the issues and, okay. and ensure the safety of those children. Okay. Robbie Butler, MLA, thanks. Is that me on? Yeah. That's I'm, the guy, I'm the guy that's in the shade. Um, guys, thank you so much for your for your time today. Um, I was picked up just beforehand, and, and Daniel just didn't feel to mention it, but he was the one that brought it to our attention in terms of just when the, the, the papers landed. Um, and very little time maybe to go through some of the, the, the papers in the detail. Um, I'm, I, the chair may ask for some used to come back. I think I'm not staying your thunder chair, but it was a, it was an issue. I'm going to just uh, own down on maybe two or three topics, guys. Uh, we got a fantastic presentation yesterday. A number of members. Um, on the issue of gender budgeting, um, um, particularly indica uh, indicators of poverty and deprivation, and it was it was a really powerful presentation. Um, so, in terms of uh, budgets and uh, rolling budgets, and we know we've got issues in Northern Ireland with underachievement in, in young males. We've got issues with food poverty, period poverty. Um, to how do you guys, as, as the financial leads in the Department of Education, view? Uh, Gender budgeting? Is it something that you, you you consider, or is it something that's there? Is it something that we need to maybe bring more focus to? Because there are strategies that are out there, and either directly or indirectly, are speaking into the issues that have, are being identified. Mm. Uh, well, I think it would form part of the. I mean, obviously, we're we're not the ones making the decision. The minister will make the decisions ultimately when we're developing a budget strategy each year. Uh, we take. Everything into account, such as what your you know gender budgeting and everything else. Everything is taken into account, but obviously the challenges, as always, are the the financial restraints, and that can that can impact you know. The, but the minister he will take his call depending on on the various needs. But it's a difficult balancing act for him. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I mean, we could pick out some of the 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 uh, things that the minister, to be fair, has has allocated as priority education on yeah. the achievement and childcare. I suppose, in, in the biggest sense, through COVID, became yeah. one of those um, things that we can see very visually, uh, particularly where um, women are disproportionately affected because they have the care of children and so on, and and then can't. So I think it's that's it's just something I'm sure we'll all turn our, our focus to. Um, guys, the, I suppose. Um, the, the main thing I want to ask you about is the spend for mental health. So um, at the start of the the, um, the mandate, I think it was something like ten million pounds per year was the indicative figure. Has that changed? Is, is it five million pounds per year, or is it separated in terms of the allocation through the COVID uh, allocation and the general allocation? And I have to be honest, I'm grateful to the Minister for Health for allocating an extra one point five million uh, to that budget annually. So uh, has five million pounds been shaved off? No, is the answer. Uh, do you want to cover that? Maybe? Yeah, the, the overall pressure for the framework is still £10 million. Uh, the Minister has put £5 million towards that in his opening budget and intends to monitor uh, the remaining pressure of five for the rest of the year, and if needs be, we can bid for it. Uh, alongside that, we've also allocated £5 million specifically for COVID-19 mental health and wellbeing, uh, which is very positive. Um, it absolutely is, and there's a, there's a piece in there about I think primary school counselling. Would that be right? Are you with that level of detail in terms of the the, the allocation of the money? Uh, it's certainly one of the, the, the considerable calls um, from from any quarter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On on the terms of primary school counselling, uh, there may be a need uh, from talking to a policy colleague on that. There may be a need to look at that again in year and bid for additional resources. We'll keep that under review. Brilliant. Okay, and I know that some uh, some 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 departmental leads did meet with Pure Mental and I, who have offered some free toolkits for some schools that are trialing them. So it's not all about spending money. There are some efficiencies out there yeah. from some of the groups. And, and really, my final question is with regard to, uh, I suppose, um, ICT. So obviously, there's been a number of projects that have been either in the pipeline or been ruled out with COVID, uh, and in terms of that remote learning did reveal stark um, disparity between those who have access to high-speed broadband, to IT facilities, um, and uh, even schools' ability to deliver remotely. Um, mm -hmm. Could you give any update on uh, ICT projects and what has been learned uh, through the, the COVID experience and how we're going to tackle digital poverty across Northern Ireland? Uh, well, it's certainly been a priority. It was uh, definitely a priority throughout last year, and everything was done to try and, and ensure that all children had sufficient access. There were a number of additional advice, devices 
either loaned out or whatever, and additional money was secured to cover that. So it's seen as a priority. I mean, there, uh, there are challenges that will have to be taken forward. Some of these challenges may actually uh, more appropriately be addressed in the replacement C2K system, for example, where there will be improvements there moving, looking to the future and ensuring and, and engaging with the Education Authority to make sure that they are capturing those real benefits that need to happen further down the line. So there's not just the replacement of something that exists, but something better and that meets the needs of, of pupils and teachers moving forward. Brilliant. Um, thank you, guys. Thanks for the confidence, particularly around the mental health monies. Um, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robbie. William Humphrey, MLA. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning, gentlemen. Thanks very much for your presentations. Um, most of the questions that I had have actually been asked uh, and answered. Um, but I suppose what I'd like to return to, Gary, is the, the issue that I've raised uh, with the Minister uh, directly at the committee here uh, and at meetings that I've had with him and with Siobhan O'Neill as well, which was endorsed by this committee. It's in relation to the immediate, uh, the immediacy of, of, of what we are facing in the, as a community uh, comes out of COVID and the, the effect, negative effects that there have been on our young people in terms of education and in terms of their, their, their mental health and general wellbeing. Uh, can I ask you, what monies has the department secured to um, ensure that we have in, in, in progress and in practice over the summer uh, a system whereby young people um, can be um, given some leadership, given some extra resource, um, both in terms of money and in terms of, of people, to help them to recover from COVID, um, given the, the huge pressures that they've been under um, with homeschooling uh, and the, the issues that, that are come with attendance at school, not least in terms of sport, recreation, interaction, and so on. Uh, and I think the key thing about this is not something which is the responsibility of the Minister of Education and his department or indeed the BLB, but there needs to be a joined up approach to all of this, which the Minister agreed to, as did Siobhan O'Reilly when she was in front of the committee. So I suppose my question is, BLB, sports clubs, youth organisations, uniformed organisations, churches and so on, how can we get them all together in terms of going to the finance minister and asking for money, going to the communities minister and asking for money, ensuring that the PHA is on board and so on, so that we get a joined up approach, multi-agency approach that actually helps to tackle this issue, which is hugely, hugely um, important in our community because mental health and wellbeing was a huge issue before the COVID pandemic. It is the other pandemic and it's going to be much worse, as we all know, at the far end of, of COVID, uh, whenever that is. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> there has been, in answer to your question in terms of the joined up approach, uh, as I understand it, it's not myself directly involved, obviously, but colleagues would be involved, particularly with the Department of Health, in seeking to have that kind of joined up approach when it comes to bidding for resources and planning out what, uh, what will work best in helping children to re-engage. There's obviously the additional money that the Minister secured in terms of the 28 Point three million that was referred to for the Engage Sure Start and uh, uh, what the other pathway or Engage yes. the summer schemes. Sorry. So and the summer schemes. So uh, plus some of the other areas that you see listed there under the COVID nineteen funding commitments. So bringing all those together, the intention is definitely to try and and really help youngsters re-engage, particularly over the summer period. Uh, and it's something the department will continue to be focused on, particularly that joined up approach that you're referring to. Gary, uh, I appreciate uh, your response, um, but I think at this stage, the intention is, needs to be much stronger. We need to have some actual commitment. I think the minister needs to drive this with other ministerial colleagues uh, to ensure that the huge challenges that young people have and will face, um, not least in an area like my own in North Belfast, where there are huge societal problems in terms of high levels of unemployment, um, yeah. social deprivation, and interface issues that we yeah. saw manifest themselves a few weeks ago. And intention is needs to be much more, there needs to be much more meat on the bones, and there's a huge urgency to this. Okay. Perhaps if we could come back to you on that, uh, I, I don't want to undermine anything that's going on in the department that I'm just not aware of. So there's, there could be more there to, to report to the committee. So we'll come back on that point. 
this is a hugely important piece of work. Uh, a strategy, a joined up strategy across government and local government statutory agencies, working with the voluntary sector in terms of churches, youth organisations, uniformed organisations and sports clubs is absolutely needed. The Minister um, agreed to that, so that you will, and we need to see that taken forward um, at pace. Um, that'll do me for today, Chair. Thanks. OK, we'll take that away. Thanks, William. Nicola Brogan, MLA. Thank you, Chair. Can you see me there? Yep. Um, thanks, Chair, and thanks to the witnesses for um, your evidence here this morning. Um, as Robbie has just outlined, actually, we had a really um, comprehensive briefing yesterday about gender budgeting and gender inequalities. And in regards to education, one of the main topics that was discussed and one of the main issues highlighted was about the lack of access to free, high quality childcare. So that's really having a massive impact on um, gender inequality throughout the North. As part of the new Decade New Approach document, it was stated that a childcare strategy should be published and that it should focus on both child development and parental employment. Um, so obviously this is an area that the Department and Education Minister needs to kind of start off with. So can you maybe tell me or outline what the Department has done to address the lack of access to um, childcare and what resources are attached to childcare at the moment, please? Okay. Well, there have been, over the course of last year, there was additional money allocated, as you're probably aware, to assist the childcare sector generally and to assist. Uh, in terms of the childcare strategy that we re refer to, obviously it still regard, requires executive agreement and approval. Um, over the past year, work on the strategy has been temporarily paused as resources have been redirected to respond to the impact of the COVID 19 pandemic on the childcare sector. And the department will be re recommencing work on the strategy by launching a strategic insight program over the coming months. Uh, the program will review the draft 2015 child care strategy and the early education and child care offer commitment in the new decade new approach agreement. Uh, it will take on board the learning from the pandemic and with input from the key stakeholders, it will help inform the development of a roadmap for the way forward. So, you know, there's still progress being made as as resources enable um can you tell me has that their insight lab actually started has it commenced work yet uh at the relaunch i think it's it's well beginning very soon over that it's, it's to take forward its work over the coming months okay um I'm sure that it's actually kicked off okay because I think that's a really important thing that we need to get started on, you know, um, so we do create a proper childcare strategy. Um, and I'm sure you'd agree with me that COVID has, you know, highlighted and made the case that we do need a comprehensive childcare strategy like, that makes that um, case more strongly. In fact, um, the Equality Commission stated that it alone recognises um, the current kind of restrictions and restraints um, and, and in that context, you know, there still remains a need for prompt action on childcare. So that's a point um, I think is really important to make and I think the department needs to focus on in the future. Um, another point I wanted to raise was about the anti-bullying legislation. Um, can you tell me what additional finances um, that are required to can implement these changes, please? Uh, have we got on? Right. Could, would you mind if we came back on that? I'm not sure that we have that level of detail with us. No, it's okay. That's, that's relatively new. That's fine. Those are the main questions I want to raise today. So thanks very much for that. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, and thanks for the questions on childcare and for the update in relation to childcare. Gary, as, as Nicola and Robbie have both alluded to, we received a comprehensive brief, uh, brief in relation to uh, gender budgeting and um, mm -hmm. obviously. We would argue that gender inequality is pervasive in education budgeting. Um, it's encouraging to hear of the Insight program um, and obviously of the, the, fund, the funding that was released during uh, the pandemic uh, or has been released during the pandemic to assist with childcare. But that, that was to, uh, to try and avoid childcare provision reducing. We need to increase childcare provision. We need to reduce the costs for families and it's a priority for this committee that um, robust budget line items would appear in relation to that area of provision. Mm. 
uh, particularly frustrating when you hear of 20 million underspends um, and no childcare strategy in place. Okay, can I bring in uh, Morris Bradley there? Morris with us? Sorry, could I, Chair, could I just pick up yeah, on... Yeah, Gary, come the in there while I'm checking if Morris is with us. Go ahead, yep. Yeah, you referred to 20 million underspend. Just to be clear, there's, there isn't a figure for what a potential underspend will look like for last year. That's still being worked through by the Education Authority. That's that's the, the general rule that departments live within, you know, within 1%. But, you know, we, we would hope that it wouldn't be okay. 20 million. So hopefully it'll be mitigated further than that. Okay. Clark, is Morris there? No. No, Jim. Not just no. at the moment. Okay. Okay, Gary, Gary, just in, in conclusion on the resource matters then, um, yeah. you in your, in your opening remarks said, stated that the underlying financial issues in education remain and we previously mm -hmm. heard reference to financial crisis in education. Um, what Can you say more about that? What, what is the, the nature and the extent of the underlying financial issues for education? Uh, well, I think a lot of this may come out in any case with the independent review that's being taken forward. But it's, I suppose the point that I was stressing at the start is because last year was an unusual year and so much money was poured into the sector, which was great that we were able to secure that, the Minister was able to secure the additional funding. It, it, it has the risk, I suppose, of uh, shielding the fact that underneath the surface there are still the underlying problems where some a number of schools would still feel that they are not receiving sufficient funding and you know there's the, the issues that have to be looked at under underneath and that's why i would stress that we still have pressures that we will be keeping under review as the year progresses 100, 145 million normal pressures and 29 million COVID related so it, what, it's what just is the, what is the what, what will the impact be of 145 million pound of on that pressure uh well, obviously, every effort will be made by ourselves, the Education Authority and schools to live within budgets. So hopefully some of those pressures can be mitigated as the year progresses, as has happened in previous years. Hopefully we will be able to bid for and secure additional resources in year as we've had success, a lot of success in the past doing. Um, because education, like health, will often be given priority by the executive because of the nature of the pressures. So we could, we, I couldn't assess at this stage. It's just something we keep under review, and I just want to be transparent with the committee that that's where we stand at this point in time. Is there still a financial crisis in education? I think it's something that needs to be kept under review, and obviously the findings of the independent review may may lead to changes. So, some of it is just the way that we are structured in Northern Ireland, but nonetheless, we have to we have to be cognizant of the pressures that schools are telling us they're they are under. Okay. and keep to work with them. Why do we continue to subject schools to one-year budgets, notification of which they receive after financial years have commenced? Mm -hmm. On that point, I wouldn't dispute your concern there. It's a concern that we have. We obviously moved as quickly as we could. The budget process this year uh, went on a bit longer than was originally anticipated. Uh, the ex executive was continuing to discuss budgets right up to the war. We moved as quickly as we could getting budgets out. We, we like your comment uh, states, we aren't happy with one year budgets, particularly on the capital side. It's extremely difficult to plan capital schemes over uh, when you're only getting the one year budget. So it's, uh, we will continue to lobby the Department of Finance on this. And I know that they have also been lobbying Treasury. And uh, now part of it, probably is the response to COVID-19 and the uncertainties that, that the Chancellor himself is facing and trying to plan for the future. But it's not really a satisfactory way to plan. I, I don't disagree with you there. We just have to do the best we can. And why, why is it happening? Well, it's driven by Whitehall as opposed to locally. I mean, we, we're, Northern Ireland was only given a one-year budget, and had, this has been the case for a number of years now. We continue to lobby that it's not the best way forward by any means. Okay, brief question for me before I allow uh, Philip to make some brief remarks on the capital and take some very brief questions in that regard. The, the Department of Education business plan for last financial year, 2020-21, uh, end of year monitoring document uh, shows that 
62%, only 62% of all commitments were fully achieved. What's your assessment of that achievement rate? Um, I would imagine I'm, I'm, it's another director actually that leads in that, but from a general comment point of view, um, I am assuming that quite a number of those business plan objectives couldn't be met fully or at all because of the COVID pandemic and addressing okay. a lot of the urgent issues. Some of the issues included that in those non-fully achieved actions are Children's Services Cooperation Act, Newcomer mm -hmm. Policy, Children Young People Strategy, Area Planning, STRU, Shared Campus, Major School, Capital Works and Health and Wellbeing of Education Staff. Mm -hmm. And there would be a number of factors underpinning that. Uh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't just be one factor, but certainly the, the pandemic would have had an impact because uh, staff within the department and across the sector have been under significant pressure. But uh, there could be legislative issues there and the ability to get legislation through the assembly. Um, and is, there a, is there a plan in place to address those what, sort of like key actions that haven't been achieved? Yeah, all of those will be looked, again, looked at again as part of this year's business planning process. And obviously it's important for the department to ensure that plans are as realistic as possible. So if there are insurmountable factors that can't be overcome this coming year, those would be taken into account as we plan for the future okay. year. Okay. On a positive note, Gary, the committee has prioritised holiday hunger provision, paid poverty provision and early years reading provision, in particular the book trust schemes. Um, all of which the department has provided uh, a, a degree of funding for. So we would welcome yeah. provision in, in, in those regards and indeed at some point hope to hear about an attempt to mainstream those hung holiday hunger provisions on a permanent basis. But we're incredibly short for time today. So um, we, we do recognise the provision that is made in that regard. I mentioned Stroll Campus as being one action in the business plan that had um, unfulfilled uh, commitments relating to it. Uh, can I bring in uh, Philip at that point for some brief comments in relation to capital budget and take some short, concise questions from members? Thanks. Okay, yeah, I'll be very brief um, and refer back to the table we discussed earlier, which I think you'd said was page 78, which shows the um, the, the total budget allocation which we have received uh, this year, which was 147 million of executive capital and 11 million of fresh start capital. Uh, as I said, the, the table, uh, the column on the right hand side is our initial allocation, and that's compared against uh, the, the actual outturns or forecast outturns in previous years. Uh, and the two are different. The, the 147 million is well below the level of spend that we've had in the last number of years by the end of the year. but. Uh, the other side of the coin is it's actually higher than the initial allocation we were given last year. I um, mean, you know, we were successful in attracting an additional 20 million uh, in bids through the year, and it would certainly be our intention that we would we would be bidding for additional capital in this year because there are uh, pressures within some of those programs. Uh, and as we've referred to previously, we've already made a bid under RRI borrowing for 14 million pounds for minor works. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, there likely would be additional bids as we go through the year. So just very briefly, some of the rationale in the table on the on that right hand column shows the uh, initial allocations to each of the programmes and the rationale behind that. Uh, the major works in the school enhancement programme have basically been given their full demand, if you like, of what they, they feel is required on the basis that um, slowing down, those projects are long-term projects which need to maintain momentum. Stop, start during, you know, due to budget constraints uh, is, is highly undesirable. So as is normal, they, they would usually get their, their, their full allocation. Uh, same applies to the youth program, um, albeit it, it, it uh, is more variable. Uh, we're more dependent on third parties uh, moving uh, at the speed that, that uh, we anticipate. But same principle is applied. The ten million pound to the youth program is based on you know an anticipated program. Um, the other areas then uh, are uh, are where the pressures lie. Um, we have a forty million pounds allocation on the other capital line, 
and that is mainly related to ICT and to transport uh, and the precise timing and, and uh, I suppose, uh, allocations between the different uh, strands of that will, will be something we'll keep under review. Um, but there are definitely pressures on, on that line. Uh, if if uh, the full wish list, if you want, uh, was to be um, was to be achieved, and then as in other years, we've used the minor works program in the initial allocation as the balancing pot, uh, and and again there are clearly are pressures there as well. If there are not additional allocations in year or we're not successful on the borrowing, um, we would have problems if if uh, if the minor works program remained at at forty six million, um, but. As with other years, there there usually is money comes free through the year, and as I said previously, minor works are relatively uh, quick things that we can turn on when we need to if, if we have money available. Uh, and so I would anticipate that as we go through the year, that forty six million will will increase. But but in summary, um, there are pressures. Uh, there are pressures related to ICT and to to minor works. That we will we will need uh, or hope to be successful in in bidding for additional capital through the year to meet the demands that are there. Thanks, Matt, Phil. We'll try and be concise in our questions as well. Then, um, in your in the department's own words in the briefing that the committee has received this morning, the initial allocation of forty six million for minor works is very low by historical standards and would, in all likelihood, result in significant pressures for schools waiting for much needed investment in their accommodation. An application for the so funding through the Reinvestment Reform Initiative has been made to the Department of Finance for urgent minor works related to the delivery of additional accommodation required for September this year, totaling £14 million. Pounds. However, there is no guarantee that this bid will be met. Why are we in that sorry state of affairs, Philip? Um, well, the 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 should, should say the accommodation for September will be funded out of the minor works in in some way. If if we are unsuccessful in the in the bid, then you know those those projects will be prioritised. The the pressure would then fall on the less urgent minor works uh, that that you know aren't required. The the RRI. Um, uh, there are there are um, rules around what can and cannot be uh, uh, allocated RRI funding, and uh, those projects fit the the, the requirements well, uh, and that's why I suppose the bid was labelled against those. Um, if we are unsuccessful, we will have to look at at reallocation of our existing capital in some way to to deal with those urgent works. But I mean to answer your question overall. We have a, a, a greater demand here for capital across all the programs than we have been given an allocation. Uh, we have to we have to prioritise and and allocate to projects that are are programs that are contractually committed, uh, and then prioritise uh, urgent and uh, uh, you know when minor works are concerned health and safety related projects in advance of of the others. So there has to be some sort of prioritisation process. So the actual spend on minor works last year that I imagine a lot of schools will say was inadequate already was £74 million. Pounds. The initial allocation for minor works this year is £46 million, pounds, which I think is approximately 60% of last year's budget. What What is the potential impact of, of that level of allocation on the standard of accommodation provided for children in our schools in Northern Ireland? Well, I think, again, be careful. That, that, that's an initial allocation. If we are unsuccessful in the bids in, in, in June uh, for the RRI borrowing, we would have to look at uh, reprioritising across the programmes. So the likelihood is there would be an impact on some of the other programmes because I would suggest there is a limit uh, that that you can reduce minor works to, but but forty it probably needs to be above forty six million. So uh, I mean the, the issue is not necessarily related directly to minor works. You're focused on it, and we're focused on it because it's used as the balancing pot, if you like. The real okay. issue is overall the whole program. So uh, let, let are... me apologies for interrupting briefly. There's a. a... 
minute silence at 11 um, in respect of International uh, Workers Day. We're going to respect if you're content with that and then we'll uh, come back in to you if that's okay. Okay, Clark. Okay, thanks, Dad. Members and officials appreciate uh, respecting that. Phil, just to follow on then from those questions, um, you're right to say that the, uh, the £46 million pounds is an initial allocation. If you're successful with the bid for £14 million, of which the briefing says there's no guarantee, that takes you to £60 million, which is still significantly less than the final outturn of £74 million for last year. How concerned should we be in relation to minor works for schools this year? Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to make sure we've brought the officials back into the spotlight, please, thanks? Yeah, they've, they've brought the members all back in for the minute silence. Yeah. We're just readjusting. Okay. Thanks. We'll just wait. They might need to mute themselves in Rock Gale. Yeah. So if, if Assembly Broadcasting can bring uh, officials back into the spotlight, and if I can check that officials' devices are unmuted? Yes, we're yeah. unmuted. Okay, thanks, Philip. Yeah, yeah. well, as I say, across the programme, there undoubtedly is a pressure. Um, whether, and, and you know, if, if that remains, we will have to decide where the, the, the pain is taken, if you like, on, on a prioritised basis. Uh, it may not be in minor works where that that you know we decide that the uh, the pressure remains. Uh, you know it may be that some of the transport spend that I've talked about has to be slipped into a future year. Some of the ICT spend maybe has to be slipped into into future years. At the point where we know exactly what what the size of the pressure is, the, the minister would have to take a view on um, where where that. You know what? What will be funded and what will not in year? Okay, I think I've used most of the time, but this is clearly a significant uh, budgetary challenge for the department and for schools, and therefore for the education of children and people across Northern Ireland. Members, we are an extremely tight schedule, so if we could ask that we uh, try to restrict ourselves to one key, concise question and answer uh, from officials in relation to the capital budget, and um, can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat in? I'm okay, Chair. I have no question on that. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Pat. Uh, Robin Newton? Uh, CM Chair. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan? No, Chair, I've asked what I needed to ask. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robbie? You might be on mute, Robert. Similarly content, sir. Content, okay, that's great. Uh, and then William, one, any questions? William, you might be on mute there. Okay, I'll just check uh, Nicola. Um, no, I'm Graham, Chair, thank you. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe I could just ask in closing then, uh, Philip, uh, what, what's the current uh, state of progress in relation to the Strew Shares Education Campus? Um, well, as I understand it, the, the, uh, there's work ongoing looking at, uh, with the schools, looking at the uh, benefits realisation part of the, 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 the project. And the view would be, and, and I think the, the Mark Brown, the permanent secretary, is, is bringing himself up to speed with the issues uh, on the program, and uh, that that they would hope uh, in the near future to be in a position to uh, come to a landing as to the, the the best way forward and the timing going forward. But that doesn't that program does not fit within my portfolio, so I can't be be absolutely precise for you, I'm afraid. Okay, there there was a recent tender for. Delivery and construction of the campus is that right? Um, well, there, there had been back before the the um, the, the um, delays that had taken mm -hmm. place. A tender had been um, uh, underway, um, but I think that whole process will have to be refreshed. Um, you know, when when hopefully things uh, are are unblocked and are able to move forward. So there will be a retendering. Well, the precise nature of that is the program team are looking at the, the whole procurement issue. So I don't want to make any statements that, that might uh, compromise that in some way. But, you know, in the mechanism by which uh, the, the program will move forward is, is currently being considered. OK, we could probably allocate a session to the Shared Education Campus and uh, we don't have time to do that today. We'll maybe return to it. Um, thanks very much indeed uh, to all of you for your time this morning. There's a, a lot of issues there and we, we may um, return to you in the near future. But thank you for that briefing today, folks. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove the officials uh, and to bring members back into the spotlight? Ask the clerk to summarise any actions or requests from that briefing. Um, okay, Chair, um, just checking that. Yeah, I'm not good. Um, so that, that I think there's a there's a big picture um, set of questions that we want to um, write to the department about, and that's the overall underinvestment in education, um, which is having this knock-on effect of one-year budgets and um, bringing everybody very close to the wire. Um, also, um, specific specifically, members wanted to ask about um, the joined-up approach um, between. Um, DE and other departments and uh, sectoral bodies to um, mental health. Um, I think the issue of the common funding formula um, and closure of transformation program is something that was communicated to the committee, um, but evidently there it's something that maybe the committee would like to take a briefing about um, in terms of the department being able to um, we balance um, the amount of funding that is going to early years um, education. Um, the childcare strategy then, um, there, were, there were some discussion and some answers on that um, and I think the committee would probably like more information about the timeframes for the strategic insight program that's beginning and perhaps um, a refresh briefing for the committee on the 2019 um, draft childcare strategy which has been Put back out now um, to these um, insight groups. Um, the official said that they would come back to the committee about um, the funding that is going to underpin um, the implementation of addressing bullying in schools um, legislation, and that was that was one of the so childcare addressing bullying in schools um, and the kind of. Um, deprivation and underachievement of young males, those are issues that came up in the gender budgeting um, presentation that members had yesterday. Um, so I think in terms of the committee's understanding of some of the processes um, that underlie budgeting, um, there are some questions we can ask about um, planning and screening um, for gender impacts um, and whether the department is collating and disaggregating data um, on a gender basis to inform this. Um, some of these measures are invest to save, you know, period poverty and holiday hunger are obviously increasing participation of children in, or pupils in school and increasing 
um, their achievement levels. Um, there's another big one, which is female participation in STEM subjects. Um, and actually that is having a major impact on the economy because um, there aren't enough uh, pupils in, the, in these um, subjects uh, to, to build that industry. Um, again, on understanding of processes, the budget context this year is obviously you know, affected by all of the huge things that have been happening, but um, one uh, set of guidance that would normally give members some understanding um, of, of, um, of movement of money at this time of the year is the in-year monitoring process. Um, and this year, the Department of Finance has not yet provided guidance um, on how that works. And that means that it's harder to have visibility of you know, what flexibility are there, what are the rules for monitoring this year, um, uh, you know, what can and can't be done within the parameters set for the department. So I think that we can ask in our letter um, about how much engagement there has been between uh, DE and DOF about that um, to enable the committee to exercise effective scrutiny. I think they sound like constructive suggestions, Clark, and perhaps I'd add that um, we would add a request at the end of that correspondence to say that the committee would welcome an opportunity for uh, both the written response to that correspondence, but also uh, an, an additional oral briefing um, to, to provide us some more substantive engagement on some of those issues. Members content to agree those actions? Sure. Yes, sure. Lord. <clears throat> it's just in line with the point that uh, William made in need for a joined up uh, holistic strategy working across both uh, central government and local government uh, and indeed working closely with uh, all the providers of uh, youth service provision, be it uh, statutory bodies, be it uh, uh, local community organisations and the voluntary uh, groups and so on. But key to that chair is going to be the uh, 11 district councils. I wonder if you could add to uh, the, 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 um, the, the burden of, of the secretary in terms of um, writing to the councils to determine what strategy they might be putting in place to address these, these uh, issues over the summer and, and into uh, the next academic year, Chair. Okay. Just have to cover that, Clark, yeah? Yes, indeed. Okay, thanks. We're tight for time, members, but any other actions requested? No? Okay, I think this, I think a further briefing and engagement with the department on those budgetary issues would be prudent, uh, and we'll, we'll seek to schedule that. Uh, at a suitable time if members are content. Members content to move on? Content, sir. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Clark. Thank you. Agenda item six then, members, is our briefing from Queen's University and the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth on youth engagement. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 89, tabled briefings from Professor Lumley and the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth uh, at the Government of Ireland. I uh, can also refer you to the Government of Ireland Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth report entitled Participation Framework, National Framework for Children and Young People's Participation in Decision Making at page 93 and the Committee for Education letter to the Department of Education on the Revised Children and Young People's Strategy at page 152. Can I give a very warm welcome to Professor Lundy from the School of Social Sciences and Social Work at Queen's University Belfast and hopefully also Linda O'Sullivan, Assistant Principal Officer from the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. You're both very welcome this morning. I'm sorry that we don't have more time to spend with you, but we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, we have uh, 
no more than 10 minutes for opening statements and then I'll try to make sure we get as many questions covered from our members in, as possible in the time that we have. Thanks so much for your, your time today. Yeah, uh, thanks Chris. I, th I think um, we agreed, Linda, I would go first quickly and I appreciate you're under pressure from time from the last meeting. So if I can, I'll share my screen and I'll do a very quick um, presentation. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so just really briefly, I think Linda and I are both going to come at this from the same perspective, which is children's rights and this particular provision, which I'm not going to go into, Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which gives children and young people the right to have their views sought and given due weight. I did want to take a few minutes to talk about this because it is so off Northern Ireland. I um, have a model of child participation, which you'll hear briefly about. Um, and it came from Northern Ireland, it came from our children and young people, and it came about as a result of the very original study done by the first Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. And just what really happened in that study for me was I understood what the legal text, my background as law, was requiring. And I had adults across Northern Ireland telling us that um, they were doing it, they were doing the voice of the child, they were seeking children's views and giving them due weight. And right bang in the middle, we were listening to over a thousand children and young people in every aspect of their lives saying, that's not what's happening. No one's looking for our views, or if they are looking for our views, they're not actually taking them seriously or doing anything with them. Or if we give our views, actually we're, we're, we're dismissed and challenged as saying, that we're being cheeky or whatever. So um, I started really thinking about how, how do we do better here? Um, what does this provision require? And I started thinking this notion of the voice of the child or in the education context, student voice or pupil voice was actually increasingly problematic and it, we had to rethink it. And I came up with a new model which said voice is not enough, that we need space, voice, audience and influence. I'm not going to describe it now because there's a very nice checklist at the back of the briefing produced by the Irish government which really explains it better. But it's really to capture it, to say why it's been, been uh, taken off, is that it's really making sure that you know when we do this, we do it in ways that are safe and inclusive, that we give choices, that we inform young people, that we make sure their views go to the right places, and then we do something with them and they we tell them what we do. That's the model in a nutshell. This diagram was created by the Irish Government uh, Department of Children and Youth Affairs back in 2012, and it kind of went globally viral. It's used all over the world now, World Health Organization, European Commission, lots of other governments. Um, but what I really want to do in the few minutes I have is really my take. I, I've done a lot of work across the world advising governments and government agencies and child and youth participation. Here's my take on Northern Ireland. I think, you know, we've got so much going for us. We have an incredibly vibrant children's sector. <clears throat> I mean, there's so many brilliant organisations, Children's Law Centre, Youth Forum, Include Youth, NCB, all really modelling good practice here. We have a brilliant Commissioner for Children and Young People in their participation office. In the public sector, we have pockets of good practice. There is really good work going on in you know, councils, um, city councils and otherwise. There's some good practice going on in schools. I'm really delighted that you yourselves are modeling good practice, that you're having young people in. I mean, that should be absolutely routine. Um, and there's been a really exciting and recent surge in activity with the assembly, with the Department of Education's participation group and with this youth-led movement, the Secondary Students Union for Northern Ireland. Our challenges, and these are challenges worldwide, one is addressing scepticism. You know, people think that actually children aren't capable of, of engaging or they think it's, it's not worth the money without just talking about costs. Our second challenge is being inclusive of all children in all communities. I think one of our biggest challenges is including children with disabilities, especially those with learning disabilities. And in Northern Ireland, we have this additional uh, challenge that not all of our communities are feeling heard. And we've seen in recent weeks some of our children and young people taken to the streets because uh, they don't think they have a voice and they think that's the way they'll be heard. And we also have the general challenge about accountability and making sure that we get back to them. So my recommendations, this is my last minute, is um, you know, it's, it's, it's very ad hoc. And one way of making it not ad hoc is to make it a legal requirement. At the minute, as far as I know, the only legal requirement is about bullying and discipline policies in Northern Ireland. We need education and training, and Linda will tell you about what's been going on in the south of Ireland. Support for children's and youth, and youth sector is crucial. This will not happen if you do not have a well-resourced children and youth sector who are building capacity and engagement with children in non-formal spaces. We need child and friendly youth information. I mean, one of the projects I'm doing at the minute that I'd be happy to talk about is the 
for the European Commission, who have agreed that all their law and policy will now have a child-friendly version, and our team at Queen's is writing the guidance on how to produce that. It would be wonderful if we actually had all our law and policy in Northern Ireland having a standard child-friendly version. And finally, we need effective mechanisms for consultation. And we have some, um, we're getting the Northern Ireland Youth Assembly, which is like so exciting, um, but we need other spaces as well. And I've put some of those in the briefing paper for you. And just finally, I genuinely think we could become a world leader in this area. We have incredible expertise across Northern Ireland in doing this. Our size makes all things possible. I'm thinking, I, mean, I work with a lot of small jurisdictions on this. And for instance, I'm working with Andorra at the minute. And Andorra is able to get out to every child in its schools because it has that access. And we have that access to and then finally, I think if ever there was a society that needed a press, that had a pressing need for this, it's us. Uh, that's me. That was a very quick presentation, and I don't know how to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thanks so much, Laura. I can hand over to Linda. Can you hear us okay, Linda? Apologies, I was clicking on the wrong button to unmute, very sorry. Um, thank you very much, Laura, and I will attempt to share my screen now and I will attempt to be uh, just as brief. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Yes, great, thank you. So uh, I'm going to speak about the implementation of uh, the, our strategy on children and young people's participation in decision making. So the context for the strategy um, is that it is one of the constituent strategies um, of the Better Outcomes, Brighter Futures National Policy Framework for Children and Young People, uh, in which the voice is a core principle and transformational goal. Um, so under the policy framework vision, um, the voices of child, the voice of of children being heard is a core principle. Um, again, also uh, based on our commitments to Article 12 of the UNCRC um, on uh, the right of the child uh, to express their views and have those views given due weight, as Laura already mentioned. Um, so the goal, focus and priorities of the strategy is that children and young people would have a voice in their individual and collective lives across the five uh, national outcome areas of the, the children's strategy and that it focuses on the everyday lives of children and young people and the places and spaces uh, in which they live their lives and where they're entitled to have a voice in decisions that affect their lives. Um, and underlying this is uh, the belief that children are not adults and becoming or beings and becoming but are citizens of today with the right to be respected and heard um, as citizens during their childhood, uh, teenage years and their transition to adulthood. So the objectives of the strategy, um, children and young people will have a voice in their local communities, in education all the way through early education, formal and non-formal education systems in decisions that affect their health and well-being, including health and social services delivered to them and in the courts and legal system. And uh, our department takes a role uh, in supporting the implementation of the strategy by providing effective leadership to champion and promote participation of children and young people and advocacy, um, and by ensuring and supporting and providing uh, education and training for professionals who work with and on behalf of children and young people, and by championing and supporting uh, the mainstreaming of participation of children and young people in the development of policy, legislation and research. So we, uh, the strategy is based on Professor Lundy's model of participation, which uh, she outlined in her presentation. And uh, all government departments and agencies have commitments and actions under the strategy in any decision-making processes, in the, the design of any programs um, or services that have an impact on the lives of children. 
and young people. Uh, so in the past uh, three years, um, DCE DIY, as it is now, I should have updated that, has consulted with children and young people in partnership with other government departments and agencies on uh, a whole range of issues, including in education, young people's views on teacher supply, uh, on the review of the uh, curriculum for relationships and sexuality education, on the active schools program. Um, over 4,000 young people uh, were consulted on the development of the LGBTI national youth strategy, um, uh, the Heritage Council strategy. In recent times, even uh, during restrictions, we consulted via Zoom with young people on the Environment Protection Agency's new strategy. Uh, also informing policy, such as government response to the impact of COVID on the well-being of young people, uh, informing the actions of a new parenting unit to support parents, um, on the voice of the child in adoption proceedings, on the Guard the Youth Diversion Program for children um, in, in trouble with the law or in danger of becoming in trouble with the law uh, on young people's participation in sport. And uh, quite recently, um, on the review of the Child Care Act. That's just a range of the types of uh, consultations that we have supported and worked with other government departments and agencies on. So currently uh, underway or in planning, uh, we have consultations going on across the country at local and at national level on the new Climate Action Plan. Um, uh, we are currently engaging with children's lived experiences of their children's rights in Ireland as part of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability review processes. Uh, on the design of a new school library project uh, under the Laureate Nanoke program, on a new professional learning framework for teachers framework, um, a new strategy for family law, uh, national skin cancer strategy, online safety, artificial intelligence, and a new rural action plan. So that's just a range of the types of engagements with uh, children and young people that we support and work on. Uh, so we use a range of methodologies that are child uh, friendly, child appropriate. Um, and uh, this is an example of the types of methodologies that we use uh, to uh, enable the, the Lundy model and the full participation um, of children and young people. Um, and, and, and this adopts according to the age of the children and the environment. We have also developed uh, more recently during COVID restrictions, uh, online methodologies to continue this work, um, but it is restricted and works mainly with more mainstream older children and young people. It's more difficult with younger children and with uh, vulnerable children or young people or children or young people with disabilities. But one of the mainstream consultations that we consulted, that we um, carried out via Zoom recently, was um, a report on the environmental um, protection agencies um, remit and uh, to inform its new strategy and on the impact of COVID on young people's um, mental health and well-being. Uh, so uh, one of the core actions in, or one of the, the keystone actions, I should say, in the strategy is the establishment of Hubna Oak. And Hubna Oak is a centre of excellence and coordination um, to support government departments, agencies and NGOs to give children and young people a voice in decision making um, with a particular focus on those that are seldom heard. Um, and uh, the key objectives are to support implementation of the strategy uh, and also to develop, document and disseminate uh, innovative international best practice on children and young people's participation in decision making. And one of the ways in which we do that is uh, with the provision of an online library on the website, hubnanog.ie. And uh, over the coming period of time, we will be uh, 
increasing our work with third level and adult education institutions on uh, rolling out um, modules on voice of the child across all pre-service education for professionals who work with or on behalf of children and young people. So some of the training uh, that we that Hubn and Oak has provided recently includes to the Department of Education Inspectorate, Creative Schools Associates, Active Schools Teachers, the Education Research Centre, the Health Information Quality Authority Inspectorate, the Arts Council of Ireland, the National Gallery of Ireland Education Team, Sports Ireland Coaches, and there is plan for um, wider scale rollout of Hubn and Oak based on the newly uh, launched participation framework, which was just launched a number of weeks ago, where we worked intensively with Professor Lundy and um, a very wide range of focus groups of professionals who work across all types of different contexts with children and young people from education to social work to pediatric nurses, um, junior liaison or junior liaison officers in on board the Shiakana and the police force, and uh, and across from early years to uh, youth services. So uh, the framework supports organisations to improve their practice in uh, listening to children and giving them a voice. Again, grounded in the UNCRC legislation and the participation strategy, uh, it came about from the growing number of requests for guidance and support on how to uh, engage with children and how to meet, meet commitments under the strategy, uh, and also due to a lack of clarity about what participation is and what it is not. And uh, there's very clear uh, guidelines in there using a, a rights-based approach uh, on how to engage children and young people at all levels of decision-making, uh, and also in everyday services and everyday contexts providing a model, checklist and feedback forms uh, with guidance uh, on how to involve children, to how to prioritize their perspectives, how to involve the seldom heard and how to give feedback. So that is the checklist as Laura outlined earlier. And uh, here is just a photograph of three young people following a consultation. So I'm not sure whether I stuck to time, but I hope I did. And I think I have stopped screen sharing. That's that's right. Yes. yes. Great. Thanks so Thank much, you. Laura and Laura for those excellent presentations. Um, I'm going to go straight into uh, questions because you've given us so much to think about. And obviously, um, Professor Lundy, as you, as you stated earlier, inclusion of children and young people in, in government decision making has been a real priority for our committee. And um, so we're, we're delighted uh, to make this initial contact with yourself and Linda today. Hopefully this is something maybe we can develop further as well, given the short time that we have today. But um, let, me, let me ask what seems to be the obvious question. Um, Ireland has a national strategy on children and young people's participation in decision making based on your model of child participation in government decision making. Professor Lundy, you're based at Queen's University here in Belfast. Um, has the Northern Ireland executive engaged with you um, in terms of children and young people's participation in decision making? Not until recently. <laughs> I think okay. uh, Kula, the Children's Commissioner, always used to say I was Northern Ireland's best kept secret. <laughs> I'm doing it everywhere else in the world but Northern Ireland. But at the minute, I think it's really positive. Suddenly, I think there is an appetite and I think people have realised I'm here and can be helpful. But we've so much expertise. It doesn't just rest on me. There's lots of expertise right across our sector. That, that, that's, that's great that we've got that. Uh, we've got you in, included in uh, trying to make sure our, our framework builds on, on that best practice. Um, and, and can I ask then, uh, Linda, what, what at, a, at its core um, does the participation framework do in terms of including children and, and young people? What, what, uh, what specific you know, mechanisms are, are used and, and, and what, what different outcomes are you, are you seeing as a result of that? Uh, so the framework was just launched uh, two weeks ago, so it's a little early to talk about outcomes, but I can say that following the launch, there's been a huge response uh, across all sectors um, 
for uh, copies and to engage with it. And we will be rolling out some funding to support uh, the rollout of the framework. But essentially, it's a how-to guide uh, and it really outlines what participation is, which is engagement of children and young people in decision-making as opposed to uh, a piece of research. And that's one of those kind of common misunderstandings. So it sets out a very clear pathway uh, and checklists and guides on how organizations and how professionals, even working in an early year setting, youth setting, whatever it might be, can, um, can enact the uh, model in their everyday settings uh, and, in decision, and in policy making also. Brilliant. And, and as you, you both refer to, this, this is a, a child's right at the end of the day. Um, and Professor Lundy, you mentioned law, and I, I think maybe that's something that we could be further yeah. engagement with you on then. But um, Linda, yeah. thanks so much for, for joining us today and, and for the, the fantastic work and best practice that uh, is being done in, in Ireland. Um, great that we can share in, in that best practice uh, uh, and learn from it and, and to develop our, our own models as well. But commend you for the, the work that is going on there. And thank you so much for taking time out to help us understand that a little better uh, here. At thank the you Northern for Ireland having Assembly. me. Thank you. Can I, can I bring in then uh, Pat Chain, MLA, Deputy Chairperson? There, okay. He is, he's just getting moved into the spotlight. That's me now, Chair. Thanks, uh, and, and thanks to Laura and Linda for the presentation. It's been uh, very informative and interesting. And uh, this will probably sound patronizing, but we had a group of young people give evidence to the committee about two months ago, and it was one of the most powerful presentations that I've ever. Uh, been involved in. Um, so, I mean, contrary to some of the stereotypical images of young people, uh, the the presentations were informative, intelligent, uh, enlightening in many ways to, to all of us on the committee. And uh, I'm not that long on the committee, so I, I want to commend Chris and my predecessor, Karen Mullen, for the uh, the, the role that they have played in ensuring that young people uh, have a voice in this education committee. So anyway, that's the preamble uh, out, of, out of the way. Um, I'd just like to hear how, in a particular example, young people would have a voice. What is the process? And just to take an example that's quite topical here at the minute of uh, educational underachievement. Uh, and it has been reckoned that we have one of the widest achievement gaps in the whole of Europe. Uh, uh, and some people would uh, ascribe that to the fact that we have academic selection at 10, 11 years of age. Others have a different view on, on, on how that issue can be resolved. How would young people be able to, to feed in and participate in decision making around how the issue of uh, educational underachievement could be tackled. Thanks. So, do you want me to look at this, Pat? And first of all, can I agree with you? I think it was brilliant. I watched that. Um, I watched the video of that, and it was brilliant for you to have young people in. And I think you should be doing it every time you're discussing something. It should, you know, it should be routine, and not just for your committee. It would be brilliant if they could roll it out, out across the others. But like any any issue, so educational underachievement is a big issue, and it's a, and, and young people are concerned about it themselves. It just depends. I mean, you've set up a body. Um, I think if the Irish government were setting up that body, they would have also made it a requirement that they consulted directly with children and young people, and they had children and young people informing the priorities of the actual consultations. She follows so not just being, they go and ask them in focus groups, but actually young people are there designing those designing the, the consultations designing the review have their own version of a review there's all sorts of ways other countries will have tackled this and i think it's just thinking beyond our traditional approach to tackling issues where we put adults in a room who talk to other adults who do research with adults and um, i think radically we could do something really different and 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 how would research evidence be made available to young people or so that's or 
would be a prerequisite to the consultation with them. Absolutely, and that's my centre for children's rights specialises in this. And we, you know, we advise globally on how to do that, how you produce really good quality, child-friendly information, because that's again part of my model and why it is successful is that element of saying that you need to support children not only to express their views but to form their views. And I think a lot of people put young people in a room and ask them something, and then they go, well, they don't talk, and they say they've nothing to say. But actually, you'd have nothing to say yourself if you hadn't been given some, some information and thoughts and alternatives. And that's the way we work. We've worked kind of across the world with various organisations. Um, and I think a lot of people elsewhere are adopting our approach as well here at Queen's. Not, not my model. This is a different approach to actually um, consulting with young people. There are ways of doing it. And I think we are doing it in some respects here in Northern Ireland. But um, I think we can do it uh, more consistently. Okay. Uh, and, and just uh, move, moving on to another issue uh, in, in general terms about participatory democracy. And it, it has been argued that uh, it does bring more voices in from the margins. Some people would say there's a potential risk in that. I would tend to think the opposite, that it, it's beneficial to the the democratic system, the more, the more uh, voices involved, the more varied the voices, then that's a good thing for democracy. Uh, how would you react to that yourself? Is that, is that me? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, love you, or both of you. <laughs> I think Ireland has done it differently, and I'm going to do a real boost here for the Northern Ireland Youth Assembly. I'm, I'm loving what we're doing here. I mean, I see a lot of other versions of this worldwide that come up through youth councils, so they kind of replicate existing structures. And I think what we're doing is actually really exciting because we've handed it over to young people to say, what do you want? How do you want it to look? And they don't want to copy the Northern Ireland Assembly itself. They wanted something different and they wanted it more inclusive. And they've devised a system for application that's dead easy. And they've devised criteria for getting seldom heard voices in and getting, of course, what we need in terms of representation, in terms of gender and our, and our constituencies. But I think that it's actually a really nice example. And I, would, I think we all need to kind of wish it success. I think not just for us, but globally. And it's a version of participatory democracy that's really not following the norm, I think. Okay, Melinda. Uh, so I would second that. I mean, we usually start with a youth advisory group or a children's advisory group who would design the process and pilot the process for us. So at the very start outset, we would we would design the whole process with with children and young people advising and piloting. Uh, so it allows for, um, I think, fulsome uh, participation. And, and we always emphasize the seldom heard young people. So we make an effort to ensure that on those advisory groups, we would have uh, children from seldom heard backgrounds uh, and young people from seldom heard backgrounds. Uh, and and we follow their advice on, on how they engage. Okay. 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 Thank, you, Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for those answers so far, folks. Uh, can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA, please? Again, he's just moving up um, into the spotlight. No problem. Clark, can I can I bring in Daniel McCrossan just while we're waiting to connect? Oh no, there's Robin now. That's great. Can you hear us okay, Robin? Thank you. I can thank you, Chair. I don't know what was going on, but can I thank Professor Lundy and Ms. O'Sullivan uh, for their presentation this morning? It is indeed uh, extremely interesting, and, and uh, I'm sure it will be necessary, Chair, to have them back uh, at a later stage uh, to fully engage on, on, on the issues. Uh, I have s s several questions, Chair, if that's okay. Um, uh, can I first of all can I just ask you a question? Maybe I've missed it in the report. What is the age level of the young people? Or how is that? In, in, the, in the Republic, uh, particularly, what is the age of the young people? 
We, we engage with children from junior infants, for, so four to five years and up. And this year, uh, very shortly, actually, we will be establishing a working group uh, to uh, design methodologies for, for younger children than that for early years. So, so experts with expertise in early years and working with early years um, will be informing that and we will be piloting that over the coming while. So we, we will keep you informed on that. Yeah, again, that's very interesting. Uh, can I maybe look at some areas, in, in, and I'm sure it's the same in, in, in the Republic, there are some young people who are difficult to engage with. Uh, they, they won't engage with the formal structures uh, of, of, of uh, government bodies, statutory bodies, uh, whatever. Can I ask you about maybe how you would bring their thoughts uh, in, into the arena uh, and whether or not you might think there would be any risks uh, around that? Is this for me or Nora? Do you want? Uh, we, we would go and meet them where they are. So we would go out into the communities. So whether that's, for example, um, traveler young people, we would work with the with the groups and the organisations who work on the ground with them, and we would go out into their communities and work with them there, um, or or any other minority or or seldom heard young people. We we work a lot with youth services and with youth workers, and we go out into um, those projects. For example, guard the youth diversion projects, which are the um, for young people in trouble with the law. We go and work with them in their projects with their youth workers or um, children, for example, in care. We work with their social workers. Uh, so we go out into the networks that exist and the structures that are already there and the professionals working with them on, on the ground in their own environments and the environments where they're comfortable. Well, when, when you say we, uh, what's the composition of we? Uh, so it is, uh, we have a participation unit in our department and we work very closely. Uh, we have a contract with uh, FROIGA, which is a national youth service organization. And in, under that contract, we have a number of participation officers who are very experienced practitioners. They come from a youth work background um, and they are very experienced practitioners on participation methodologies. So they, um, that's what that's what I mean by we we then partner with with relevant organisations depending on the communities we're engaging with. Okay, Can uh, and Hub Nanog, apologies, uh, through Hub Nanog also our centre of excellence. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask you about uh, then? You made reference to a number of practical projects that young people were consulted around. Was that at the conceptual stage or at the development stage or at the implementation stage of, of the the projects and, and, and are those what, what would be the scale of those projects are they national projects or are they local projects that they would be involved in and, and how was that involvement so I'll give you an example of the LGBTI national youth strategy. So the very first step in the development of that strategy was to go out across the country and meet meet with young people uh, and get their uh, views on um, lived experience um, and uh, how that, that informed the development of the entire strategy. A, a consultation report was, print, was published um, from those consultations, which then informed uh, the content of the strategy. And at that point, then um, government departments came together to negotiate the actions in the strategy and to agree the actions in the strategy. So the first step was the consultation with children and young people. And that is an approach that, that we would support as the, as the ideal uh, approach that that particularly when a strategy is is for young people, that, that it would always have to start with that step uh, first. Robin, really sorry to cut across. We're super tight for time today, so we might have to ask for a final question from you, if that's okay, thanks. Uh, okay, Chair. Um, sorry, there is so much in this, Chair. Um, yeah. I suppose then, in terms of the public servants that, that you involved in, uh, what training, what type of training what was their personal learning 
and what is their ongoing uh, development? So again, we provide training through Hogn and Oak for colleagues in the civil service uh, across a, a range of roles. And we provide fairly bespoke uh, training depending on their roles and their, uh, their level of engagement with children and young people through Hogn and Oak. Is that one day training, two days, or uh, and is it ongoing? Uh, usually, uh, it's it's two days, it, and um, it but not consecutive. There would be some time to go and engage in the ongoing work and come back. Uh, and sometimes we provide, depending on the requirements of the agency or the department, we also provide mentoring and coaching uh, and advice. And sorry, is it compulsory within the department for staff to undertake this, or how are they selected? They approach us to date. They have approached us uh, according to need, um, but we will be looking at expanding and rolling out further uh, training uh, over time. But to date, it has all been uh, demand based, where departments and agencies approach us for training. Okay. Okay, Chair, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but thank, thank uh, Professor Lundy and Ms. O'Sullivan. It's extremely interesting. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, uh, Linda and Laura, uh, for uh, being with us and for taking our questions. It is appreciated. I have a number of questions uh, to ask. going to be as brief as possible, Chair. Um, this first one's for Linda. Linda, what were the main challenges of pro uh, proactively creating a platform for youth engagement uh, that would align with the UNCRC of involving children in decision making? Sorry, would you mind repeating that? It just glitched in the middle of your question. Apologies. Yeah, okay. uh, what were the main challenges of proactively creating a platform for youth engagement that would align with the UNCRC of involving children in decision making? Um, well, I suppose that the model uh, uh, and finding uh, the Londi model was the first step. Uh, uh, now, some of this is historic uh, and predates me, but, but even in advance of our uh, strategy, we have the Corlin and Oak structure across the country, which are children's youth councils for 12 to 17 year olds in, in our local authorities. Um, so uh, both those, those two, and they're the permanent structure for youth representation. So, so in terms of um, our structures, Corlin and Oak is critical, and in terms of our, our development, the Londi model and the strategy. I'm not sure that I'm, I'm perfectly understanding your question. Um, I'm trying to unmute. Uh, were, were, there, were there problems uh, along the way that frustrated you in any way? Yes. I mean, the, I, and some of these were the challenges outlined by Professor Lundy earlier in relation to a misunderstanding on decision makers as to what participation is and, um, and understanding um, the role of children and young people and, and how seriously they take this and what they have to contribute. And it really does make for better policies and services, but that wasn't always understood. So, so I suppose the biggest challenge for us is advocacy around that uh, and really making sure that that message gets out there. Okay. And um, th th this question is for you both. What do you believe are the main current issues young people struggle to get decision makers to engage with them about? In Northern Ireland? Um, that, Neil, yeah, I mean, there's so many, but, but I think it depends on the young people again. And you know yourself, the ones who've been in front of you, mental health is a big issue at the minute. Bullying is always an issue that you're working on. But if you go to particular groups, they'll have their own issues. You know, I mean, obviously exams and, and tests and assessment has been big. It just depends. It really does. And if you went to younger children or children with disabilities, it would be different again. Um, I do think, though, to go a bit further in your question is I think there is some, it's not that, that, that they, well, they struggle to get engaged, is that I think that decision makers are more open to listening on some issues, I think, that actually fit their own agendas. And it's whenever the young people's issues maybe don't fit their agendas and priorities that it's a struggle. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a good point. Uh, and the final question, Chair, if you just indulge me, uh, Citizens Assembly participants are rigorously com uh, compiled to represent a, a, a cross section of the population reflecting age, gender, social economic factors. Um, were you able to achieve this uh, in your youth engagement exercises? Uh, and this is to both of you. And could you please tell us a little more about that? Thank you. Ursula Linda, sorry. Yeah, we we work uh, really we we work very hard to to ensure the representativeness of um, young people on in the groups that we consult with. We we put a lot of effort into ensuring that um, there's a full diverse range of children and young people uh, involved in those consultations, and that it's not uh, just the I suppose the most confident or well informed young people, but it is the the a good representation across all young people. Can I just add to that? And this is my point about Northern Ireland being small. We are yeah. small. There is no reason we can't do everybody. You know, you have a Department of Education with access to every child in school. You know, obviously there's ways we have to get children who are outside of school. And that's the work I think that's been happening in the likes of Iceland and Andorra. And I know they're smaller than us, but actually they are, they've been doing really creative things to get to every child. Andorra's children's plan. I mean, I was working with the minister there and we, I just said, why don't you do everybody? So he did everybody every child got a chance to comment they didn't all do it in iceland they did a really interesting thing they just did a representative sample to all the children in iceland and got so many of them down into reykjavik to sit in a summit with people like you on issue by issue committees there are just lots of really um there's ways you can do it when you're small that you can't do it when you're big and we're small i think for one to okay yeah, yeah that's a good point thank you very much to you both thanks daniel Thanks for your answers. Can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA, who always sticks to time? Thanks, Robbie. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I normally have to because Daniel usually uses it. <laughs> Go ahead. He was well behaved today. Um, thanks to Laura and Linda. R really, really good. And as Pat had said at the outset, we've had uh, some excellent engagement with young people. And young people have never had a better opportunity um to to be uh, involved and have their voice heard so thank you for the work that you guys have done work you put in what you've shared with us so far so as the chair of the disability apg and also member of the learning disability apg um can i ask you with regard to your inclusivity um in terms of what strategies you deploy to ensure that the voice of those who have disabilities um, and learning disabilities in particular given the fact that we know with the mental health uh, issues that we have here in Northern Ireland in particular, that sometimes when we're engaging with um, people in those communities, we fail to peel back into the, the, you know, the other issues beyond the what is known, which is the disability or learning disability. Can I go on this? Because it's something I feel very strongly about as, as well. And we have actually modelled this in Northern Ireland for the Council of Europe. We did a project for them on um, the rights of children with disabilities in the digital environment. Everybody's talking about that environment, but nobody's talking to them. And we did it with partners here in Northern Ireland. We did it with um, MenCap Learning Disability. We did it with Fleming Fulton School for Physical Disability, with Angel Eyes for Visual Impairment and Action for Death Youth. And those children advised a whole research project that went out across Europe that is now informing Council of Europe policy. And that came from our young people in Northern Ireland. There are ways of doing it if you decide to do it, but people often think they can't or they're worried about it. So we're feeling really strongly in that. And secondly, in the project I'm currently doing for the European Commission, where unfortunately I can't work with children in Northern Ireland, I'm working with two schools in the south of Ireland near Dublin. Um, we, we are producing child-friendly and disability accessible um, information and we're working with the, um, the major agency in the European Commission that works on accessibility to make sure that our laws and policies aren't just child-friendly, they're disability accessible as well. So uh, you can do it, we can do it, but it's just knowing that you should and knowing how to do it. Thank you. I know the chair, chair you, you're the, you are the chair of the APG on learning disability, aren't you? You've been involved for many That's years. Correct probably even predating me becoming a, an MLA, so um, it's really important to, to a number of us here. Guys, um, so in terms of then, so the inclusivity too, so obviously um, we engage with uh, LGBT um, disability, learning disability. Um, also, it's not often talked about, what about faith groups? Um, it's be something I'd also been involved with. So in terms of those um, faith-based organisations, perhaps, in the site, how did you go about and was there much of an uptake? And on this then, did you have participation quotas that you set at the start? Um, were you seeking participation quotas or was it an open, you know, whoever responded, responded? Um, and then did you monitor um, quotas of those who participate from the, the identified communities, if you like? 
Uh, no, we don't set quotas and we also don't ask um, young people to self-declare unless we're, we're specifically targeting a particular cohort. But we do uh, ensure that um, we, we very frequently use Coraline and Oak as our participation body. So we do ensure that recruitment onto Coraline and Oak goes through all schools. Uh, and into all communities. And we work very hard with those who work in the local author authorities on recruitment to ensure that they have the full diversity of the whole population represented on the Corla. But we never ask uh, a young person or a child to uh, self-declare or self-label in the actual consultation. Uh, we do ensure that recruitment though is robust uh, and we don't set quotas. Okay, but then how do how do we how do you know then that you've got a full representation of of, of the young people? Because we do know that there are uh, there are facets of the community that are very hard to reach. So there are there are young people out there who are fantastic and very mobilised and have the the digital technology. They have the broadband bandwidth. They have the home structure, which enables them to, and, and encourages them to be out there. And they're and, and I'm thinking particularly of looked after children here. So obviously there are agencies, but there are also many families where children are living and they're identified certainly uh, here in terms of vulnerable children. There are children whose voices often are never heard because they don't have the facility. So have you anything in your structures there that really pays back into the, the very hard to get the voice? Because if you're not you're not collating the evidence to say who they are, where they're from, then, then how do we how do we actually put the quality stamp on on what we're doing? It's a very, very good point. And we're we're establishing this year a national participation office. And part of its remit is to do exactly that, to, to really um, ensure that we are setting KPIs around those hard to reach children and young people and uh, and that we are uh, working out mechanisms about how, how we measure that. So so that is one of our priorities going forward, but it is a very, very good point. Right, and, and the very last one, I think we're going to us on the high here. So uh, did you identify perhaps the top three topics that came out from the discussions with the young people? I know I'm not going to say when, when we engage with young people, there, there are certainly two that at the very top in terms of issues that they would like to see um, talked about and, and, and acted upon. Uh, was there any output in relation to the, the top issues? So, so in, in our last All Nanog, um, Corla uh, voted on climate action, so they're particularly uh, interested in cl climate action issues at the moment. Um, but education equality is always an ongoing issue. Also, it comes up again and again, and uh, bullying, uh, drug, drug and alcohol use are all um, issues that, that, that come up very frequently for, for young people. Brilliant. Uh, yes. Um, Climate is generally the number two here. We say mental health it, it tends to be the number one, um, but climate is definitely up there. And thank you for that. Just going to add one in, just in case you could maybe do this. Um, I'm also the chair of the all-party group on reducing harm related to gambling. So there are ha sort of higher levels of young people that are gambling. It's something that's really um, useful to look into when you're looking at those addictions, you know, alcohol and drugs and stuff, and the propensity of online targeting of young people with regard to gambling and stuff would be something very useful and hope to hear from you both again soon. Thank you so much and thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robbie. William Humphrey, MLA. Thanks, William. William unmuted, okay? Just being brought into the spotlight. William, Sorry, just check. He's in the spotlight, but he's, he's muted, so I'm trying to text him, actually. No problem. William, if you can hear us, you might need to unmute the device there. Thanks. I'm just thinking that might have been what happened last time as well. Apologies if I, uh, if I failed to address that last time, William. We're not hearing you this time either. Maybe I'll, I'll bring in Nicola Brogan and we'll try and resolve uh, William's audio. Nicola, do you want to come in and we'll, we'll try and communicate with William to get that resolved? I'm sure he'll want to ask questions. Nicola, thanks. Yes, Can you hear me okay? Yes, Nicola, go ahead there. Well, 
Thanks, Chair. And thank you, Laura and Linda, for um, the presentations this morning. Really informative and a really important topic. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased you're here and presented those today. One topic I wanted to discuss, which is very topical at the minute, um, is relationship and sexuality education. Laura, you mentioned it too in your presentation. Um, so I think it needs modernised and uh, there needs to be a standardised um, RSE in, in the curriculum throughout the North. I think now that in 2021, that actually it's really unacceptable that there isn't, um, that look, many of our children don't get like a fact, fact based um, access to like inclusive sex education. So just be interested to hear your views on that there and how you think um, that young people can be brought into that conversation and um, bring about the necessary changes. So can, can I say something here? So I mean, I agree with you, but um, one of the things we, I didn't get to say is actually look for what's already done. It doesn't always require you to start and do a consultation. And Belfast Youth Forum did an amazing project on this issue, and they really shed a spotlight on what was wrong. And 60% of our children, I think it was, thought that actually their um, current sex education was not useful at all to them. So and they've already started to get into position to say what would be useful. And I know that might vary across Northern Ireland, but there's a mechanism for doing that and talking about it. And there's already data. And I think whenever you young people have already been asked, run with that. You don't need to keep them back and asking, to, you know, I mean, things can change over time, but there, are, you know, that clearly is an issue where you could, it's important to young people. They've already spoken. And I think if you're going to take it forward, you do it with them and their understanding and their concerns, because we cannot know what they know. I read something recently um, where a young person was saying about educating, what the training they got on sexting. And basically it involved um, somebody leaving a, a USB in a bush you know, just so they pass on, you know, pictures and they were going like, what kid uses an USB nowadays? It's just so out of date. So, I mean, that's why we talk, we have to talk to children, you know? Um, yeah, Laura, that's a very valid point. And actually Belfast Youth Forum um, gave us a briefing in January about that there. I think it was the NAU report it was called and um, the stats they had were, they were stark really. So um, it's something that I really do think that needs to be addressed. And I have uh, brought up with Peter Weir as education minister and will continue to do so. So hopefully he will listen to us. Um, the other point I wanted to bring up, would you have, you've already mentioned as well, Laura, is about the Youth Assembly. I think it might be a good time to actually plug it because applications open for the Youth Assembly this week. So for all 13, 17 year olds, applications are open. Um, so I think that's a really useful step um, in empowering young people and to have their voice heard. But can you tell me um, how you think that um, youth assembly members and us as MLAs and then the executive, how we can all kind of work together and work with each other to increase the like, levels of engagement and make the youth assembly more productive and meaningful. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think they're doing a great job, you know, setting that up. But I think what you can do on the other side is, is the, the back bit of my model is you are the duty bearers, you know, you're the audience and you're the potential for influence. So they have to have really decent formal two way channels of communication with you. And you've got to engage, you know, if this is going to be really mean, meaningful, they're going to recommend the structures. And I think what we're saying in the group is try it out and see what works. They're doing something exciting, you know, and a wee bit different. And I'm always really curious to see how they do it. But I think there seems to be a, a cross party appetite for this which is brilliant and i think if you all just commit to it and make it work it would be wonderful yeah i agree it sounds fantastic to me i think it's a really good initiative and i'm, I'm so pleased it's been brought forward as well i think it um it does provide a real good opportunity for the youth so that's great um that's all i have to ask so thank you both very much and thank you chair thanks nicola I think I've been lobbying for a youth assembly since i started this in 2010 um we've had some brilliant manifestations of it, a, a youth senate uh, in the assembly chamber on a, a couple of occasions in participation with the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, I, I think it was, and the, the quality of, of debate and contributions from the young people is is without fail inspirational on every occasion. So really excited to, to see the youth uh, assembly uh, being launched. Um, th thanks for those questions, Nicola, and those answers. Uh, do we have William Humphrey? Can we, can we get the Spotlight and the audio resolve for him, William. Um, I've phoned him and messaged him, Chair. I think he might just be away from his screen just now. Okay, no problem. That's grand. Um, well, look, uh, Linda, Laura, thanks so much indeed for your time today. Um, 
fantastic to see uh, your work, uh, Professor Lundy, um, being used in participation uh, and, and in partnership with uh, the government in Ireland and, and to see the fantastic work that you're doing, Linda. Um, we're, we're really um, grateful for the opportunity to connect with you. Uh, Laura, as you say, some thankfully some good examples starting in, in Northern Ireland as well and plenty for us to work together and to, to build on there. So um, it would be, be great to stay in touch with you. And thank you so much for your time today, both of you. Yeah, thank you for the invite. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank folks. You. All the best. Bye-bye. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove the witnesses and to add members back into the spotlight and check in with the clerk in terms of actions? There, there, there may not be as many actions there, clerk, and maybe we can wait on those until after the next briefing. Would that make sense? Um, sure. I think there are actions for the committee in its planning and engagement. Um, yeah, we can come back, come to it afterwards, sure. Yeah, that, that that's great. Uh, keen to move us on to agenda item seven, um, moving from youth engagement to parental engagement uh, and our briefing from the Centre for Research in Educational Underachievement at Strand Millis and Parent Kind. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? And can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 177, a briefing from CREU and Parent Kind, entitled Parents' Views on Education During the Lockdown at page 179, the Parent Kind Coronavirus Parent Survey results from March 2021 at page 204, Parent Kind Infographic on Coronavirus Mental Health and well-being from March 2021 at page 226 and the CREU survey on homeschooling during the COVID-19 crisis at page 231. Clark, am I okay to welcome our witnesses then? We have Jane Thompson, Head of Parent Kind Northern Ireland, Kirsty Yates, Research Officer at Parent Kind Northern Ireland, Dr. Noel Purdy, I think, Director of Centre for Research in Educational Underachievement at Strand Millis, Dr. Jonathan Harris, Research Fellow at the Centre for Research in Educational Underachievement, and Dr. John McMullen, Senior Lecturer at the Centre for Research in Educational Underachievement. You're all really welcome today. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you on these key issues. And given we're short for time, I'll hand straight over to you guys. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Chair um, and Committee. Thank you for providing Stranmillis Centre for Research in Education, Underachievement and Parent Kind with the opportunity to share with you today, from a parent's perspective, their experience of supporting learning from home and the impact that the pandemic and the recent period of disruption to schooling has had on their and their child's mental health and well-being. Parenkind collected um, our data through our recent coronavirus survey, as you have already referenced, in which 840 parents took part in the survey between 9 p.m. on the 9th of February and 8 a.m. on the 17th of February. We were delighted to have 13% um, of the responses from parents with a child with SEN and also the great range of representation from all of the year groups from primary one to year 14, which which is available in a detail graph in your pack. Um, as for the Strand Millis uh, crew survey, um, we had 2,002 responses from across Northern Ireland in February 2021, I should say, um, and that includes data for 3,668 individual pupils. Um, I'd like to take um, the opportunity to thank all of those uh, parents who filled in the survey and the uh, the parent kind survey for taking that time. I'm sure there are some who did both, um, and we really commend them for that. It gives us um, a lot of data to help uh, to formulate recommendations and inform um, uh, government and research. So thank you. The uh, the survey data is comparable with a previous survey carried out in May 2020. Um, our report was authored by a multidisciplinary team of educationalists, um, two of which are joining me um, today: um, Dr. John McMullen and Dr. Noel Purdy. Um, and 
our data included postcode level geographical data. So we were able to, to map with, with a fair amount of accuracy where our responses were coming from. And as you can see, um, they were uh, well spread across uh, Northern Ireland. Um, it was a balanced um, survey sample in many respects. Um, however, it's important to note that 96% of respondents were female um, and uh, there was a slightly uh, disproportionately middle class bias within the sample. So to overview the presentation today, um, we're going to go through four key areas um, as listed here, supporting learning from home, uh, inequalities in accessing remote learning, um, mental health and wellbeing, and concerns and challenges before moving on um, to recommendations. So to begin with supporting learning from home, um, we compared our data with uh, last year's uh, data from 2020 and found that 65% of parents and carers felt that the quality of learning resources was actually much better um, or better than during the 2020 lockdown, um, with only 6% claiming that the provision was uh, worse. Uh, the same majority were happy with quantity of resources, um, an increase on 3% since the 2020 survey. Um, so some good news um, on the, the progress that's been made um, between the two lockdowns. Um, in terms of delivering education to uh, pupils at home. We also found um, that pupils were spending more hours per day on average and more days per week on average. Um, we calculated it as an increase of around 18% on average between 2020 to 2021 um, on homeschooling. So in general, um, we're seeing across the board a large increase um, in the amount of time that pupils were spending um, on their learning from home and at the highest levels of time um, over four hours for up to seven days a week um, in some cases uh, were being spent in post-primary. Um, parents with a higher income or higher educational qualifications uh, were most confident in homeschooling their children um, but there was an issue with parents working from home struggling to find time um, 64 percent uh, reporting um, that they would struggle to find a balance between um, their work and homeschooling their children and there was also a very gendered division of labour um, uh, that cropped up in the data. 63% um, of mothers are saying they homeschooled versus 8% uh, of fathers um, or 26% uh, both father and mother um, uh, engaged in homeschooling. Um, so this, uh, this responsibility really did fall um, mostly on mothers. Um, in terms of um, live online teaching, um, there was uh, some significant findings. The number of parents who reported that their child school engaged in some form of, of live online teaching doubled since 2020, from 24% to almost 50%, um, whilst the number of schools not engaging in, at all in live online learning fell uh, from 77 to just over 50%. Um, and we found that uh, the majority of live online teaching was going on in post-primary schools, um, and preschool and primary were far less likely and to receive live teaching. Our findings of parents' experience at supporting learning from home in terms of the quality and the amount of support from schools was similar. And we must take a moment to commend the schools and the teachers who move quickly to teach online and provide other forms of online learning, as well as supporting learners and their parents remotely. I would also um, like to, and Stramilis are the same, we would like to highly commend the parents who for many of them were juggling work from home and for many of those that included managing staff teams remotely and inducting new staff and for many meeting daily targets and more while taking on the role of teacher and at the same time still being a parent. 45% of primary school parents and 29% of post-primary parents told us that they were spending more time now compared to 2020 overseeing their child's schooling at home. With 27% of parents with a child with SEN and 22% of primary school parents informing us that they have spent over three hours a day overseeing their child's school work at home. There is a plus side, and that is 47% of primary school parents and 36% of post-primary school parents are now more aware of what their child is learning in comparison to before the first lockdown.
We also, the same as Tram Ellis, we looked at parental confidence and 54% of parents in Northern Ireland compared to 79% of parents in England said that they were quite confident or very confident supporting their children's learning. And parents of primary school children were most confident and parents of children with SEN were least confident. On to our second uh, point, the CREW survey um, asked several questions around the availability of devices within the home, um, quality of internet connection, um, and um, other relevant questions to do with access to online um, learning. We found that uh, the majority of parents were still finding printing for homeschooling um, impossible or difficult. Um, the data displayed on, on this uh, slide um, shows that there's a, a decrease in the number of uh, respondents saying that they do not have a printer in the home um, in comparison with 2020. Um, however, we asked for a little bit more detail with, with our second survey um, and found that significant um, proportions of respondents um, were reporting that although they had a printer at home that it was too costly to print homeschooling resources um, or that uh, supplying paper and uh, printer ink um, was causing issues. So actually the majority of parents were finding it difficult to um, print homeschooling resources. We also found a slight increase in reported devices for home learning since 2020, um, with 55.7% of pupils now reporting and having an individual device for learning. There's still um, a sub, uh, small 1.3% uh, of respondents um, saying that their child rarely has access because of lack of equipment, and that's persistent across the 2020 and 2021 surveys. Because we had postcode level data, we were able to uh, map some of these um, answers. And here's one example um, just of reported internet speed. Uh, we asked parents to rate their internet speed as poor, fair, good, or excellent. Um, and actually reported internet connection uh, showed a marked, de marked decrease since 2020. Uh, of course, this is a subjective um, feeling based on the, the, the parents' point of view. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it appears to uh, be across the board um, a, a marked decrease. And um, rural areas, particularly west of the ban, uh, appear to have the least reliable connections, as shown in the red spots on this map. We were able to use this data to uh, to inform um, local government organisations, and um, as one example, um, James is going to explain here. And as many of you would expect, I couldn't let a presentation go by without mentioning Fermanagh. And unfortunately, in this case, it is to highlight one of the less positive of experiences of living in the council area of Fermanagh and Oma, and that is our connectivity issues. I was delighted to be involved with Jonathan um, and crew and engaging them along with Fermanagh and Oma Council and members of the Trust in a meeting to look at how that we could support and encourage responses from the, the counties of Fermanagh and Tyrone. So to be able to provide the Council with invaluable data that they are now um, going to use to help them inform their community plannings. So as you can see from the graphs um, provided, when we look at how parents rate their internet connection speed in Fermanagh and Oma compared to across the rest of the north, you will see that here in Fermanagh and Oma, 50% report the internet speed as being fur, poor or fair in comparison to 36% um, percent across the other county areas. Um, I'm also delighted to also highlight is that through this partnership approach with Strand Millis, we're able to see 142% increase in the number of responses from last year um, from Fermanagh and Oma. And this is really fabulous and, you know, is going to provide a strong insight to the Fermanagh and Oma Council for their community plans around the digital experience for parents here. Moving on to um, mental health and well-being. We know that despite all of the support from schools and from many employers, we are acutely aware that for many parents and children, they have not made it through the last year unscathed with little or no negative impact on their mental health and well-being.
We were pleased to be actually told by many parents that through um, our survey questions that they prompted discussions with their children about their mental health and well-being. And we all know to start talking is the best place to start. So here are some of the findings which we find. Um, parents told us that their children were coping better with the learning arrangements um, in the early part of this year. 41% of children coping better than 36% of their parents. 44% of parents and 43% of children find it harder to cope in the recent lockdown in comparison to 2020. And considerably fewer parents of a child with SEN reported that they coped well during the recent period when schooling was disrupted. Again, 44% um, of parents in Northern Ireland said that they found it harder to cope in the recent lockdown period. And when we asked parents in England the same question, only 17% there reported that they found it harder to cope during this period. We ask parents to rate their children's mental health and well-being currently, and you can see there very clearly on the slide um, the responses of which we have received from that. But to summarise those, 27% of post-primary parents are concerned or very concerned about their child's mental health and well-being compared with 20% of primary school parents. And parents with a child with SEN are far more likely to rate their child's mental health and well-being as concerning or very concerning compared with parents without a child with SEN, 39% versus 20. Parents of a child with SEN are also far more likely to seek help from someone if they have a concern and only 8% of parents with a child with SEN have not been in contact with someone else for help. And this compares to 45% of parents of a child without SEN. We can also see from this graph the dependency that there is upon school for um, both parents of a child with and without SEN um, as the place to go to when they are seeking support for their child's psychological well-being. We also ask parents to what extent has their child's mental health been affected by the disruption to the schooling over the last 11 months. And parents of a, a SEN child are more likely to say that the disruption to schooling has had a negative impact on their child's mental health and well-being than parents of a child without children with SEN. And that's 42% versus 27%. What we find very interesting is, is that actually 8% of parents with a child with SEN reported the disruption having a positive impact on their child's mental health and well-being. And 3% of parents um, who have a child who doesn't have SEN reported the same. And comparing England to Northern Ireland, 86% of parents in Northern Ireland reported that their child's mental health and well-being has been negatively impacted by the current schooling arrangements. Those were the schooling arrangements from January until March, April, compared to only 45% in England. We also asked parents what were the top three triggers to impact their child's mental health and well-being. And we have given you a clip there, but the full um, details are in the report. But to add to the top three um, triggers, which are the social isolation, inability to physically play and socialise with their friends, missing extracurricular clubs and activities, and keeping up with learning at home. In addition to that, 61% of parents with a P7 child cited the worry of what post-primary school their child would get into this year as being one of the top three worries that they have. And 41% of parents of pupils in years 12 to 14 claimed that worry about summer grades was negatively impacting on their child's mental health and well-being. For 43% of children with SEN, low self-esteem was a much higher factor on their mental health and well-being compared with 17% um, without SEN.
We also yeah. felt that with- sorry, to, sorry to have to interject just shortly. I, I think there's a, a number of slides left, so if, if I could keep you moving promptly, um, it would allow me to make sure we can get as many questions as possible as well. Thank, yes. thank you for a fantastic presentation so far. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. We asked parents what would they like to see to put in place to support their child's um, mental health and well-being. And again, these are regular discussions of mental health within the classroom, came out top, and then an assessment of every child's psychological well-being next. And following this very closely was the greater focus on physical education for when their child returns to school. And in the unprompted in responses, parents also added that it wasn't just just about sport, but also for art and music and drama and other clubs as well. Um, in terms of the crew report, I will be very brief. Um, we also have a wealth of evidence um, and data related to mental health and wellbeing, both of, of the parents and of the child. Um, and I'd invite um, committee members to, to ask the questions, um, particularly as we've got Dr. John McMullen here, um, who, who really focused on this area. Um, but very quick headlines. Um, as you can see, 80% um, of parents reported um, a negative or very negative impact um, on their mental health and wellbeing as a result of the of the most recent lockdown. 67% um, um, re re uh, reported a negative impact on their physical health and wellbeing. And in terms of impacts on uh, their pupils themselves, um, we asked slightly more nuanced questions to do with motivation and behaviour. Uh, mental health and well-being, social skills and physical health and well-being. Um, and the headline um, is that um, across the board, uh, these had um, got considerably worse um, compared with before the pandemic. Um, however, um, there was evidence to suggest within our data that uh, live teaching um, and had a, a positive effect um, on people's um, scores on these uh, these questions. Um, and also where schools were perceived by parents to place an importance on nurture, safety and well-being, um, there were also fewer negative effects um, on the pupils. Um, this is just one more um, quick chart that uh, shows the change um, between uh, the 2020 data and the 2021 data. Um, and as you can see, um, those darker reds, and there's been an increase. That means that social skills, mental health and wellbeing, behaviour and motivation have all been reported to be much worse um, in the 2021 lockdown as compared to the 2020 lockdown. So to move on to our final point um, on the concerns and challenges that, that um, parents raised, um, we asked a subset of questions to P7 parents, to Year 8 parents, um, and to Year 12, 13, 14 um, parents. Um, P7 parents voiced a range of frustrations relating to the preparations for this year's cancelled transfer tests. Uh, remember that this data was gathered um, in early February, and 45% felt that there would be a negative or very negative impact on the child's future compared with only 7% of the positive and very positive. Um, and many P6 parents also expressed concern that their children were not equipped for transfer in the coming year. Um, in terms of year eight parents, we found that uh, the majority thought their child had been poorly or very poorly prepared for transition to post-primary school in 2020, um, with children with low-income houses uh, households coping least well. Um, and 52% of parents of year 12, 13 and 14 pupils thought that the cancelled exams would have a negative or very negative impact on their child's future prospects um, and a very small uh, percentage uh, thought it would have a positive impact. Uh, finally, we did ask the question about children repeating the year and found that parents were in favour of 33% of their children repeating the year, not in favour for 54% and unsure for 13%. We asked one very open question. What one thing could your school or government uh, do to make home working better for all, uh, for all of your children? Um, and I just want to really quickly hi highlight three um, findings here. Firstly, um, if you look to the right hand side of the chart, live teaching um, is, uh, has increased uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the desire for parents to see more live teaching, to see more um, opportunities for peer interaction um, and regular check-ins, connections and pastoral care. Um, so this is something that should be seriously considered um, for continued um, home learning um, uh, as, as we continue to respond to the needs of the pandemic. Um, a second thing is, uh, is that parents want uh, the challenges of work, of their own work and homeschooling to be addressed with, with less work um, and uh, more realistic expectations, both of them and of their pupils. 
And finally, that there, there's, a, there's a few um, points that weren't so salient, so there weren't so many concerns over printing, weren't so much um, uh, so many calls for uh, better resources or materials or more guidance or support for parents, uh, which may indicate that there's been some progress made um, between 2020 and 2021 on those points. So I will quickly go through the challenges which parents reported to us and the top three challenges in which parents have faced with schools being closed the majority of pupils over this last term was juggling work and homeschooling, motivating their child to do their work and the impact of parent-child relationship with the parent constantly being on the child's back as parent and teacher. And the notable differences between parents of primary and post-primary children were juggling work and homeschooling. This was a greater challenge for 63% of primary um, compared to 49% of post-primary um, parents and being able to provide support to all um, subjects and levels as you would expect was a greater challenge for post-primary parents of post-primary children at 29% versus 18% um, for primary. Also, the top three challenges for a parent of a child with SEN, the top challenge was motivating their child to do their work, followed by juggling work and homeschooling, and then supporting a child with a disability or challenging behaviour with limited or no respite. 30% of parents with a child with SEN cited feeling able to support a child who is struggling psychologically with the impact of lockdown as a great challenge compared to 17% of parents without a child with SEN. Parents in Northern Ireland are far more likely now than parents in England, um, where only 26% of parents are more worried about the impact of the pandemic on their child's education. Um, now, there has also been a big increase in the level of concern since May, when 33% of Northern Ireland parents said they were more worried about the impact of the pandemic on their child's education compared to when schools first closed in March 2020. So, I mean, to look at that, 70% of parents in Northern Ireland are now more worried than they were in March 2020 about the impact of the pandemic on their children education. So I'm just going to move on quickly to recommendations um, coming from both of our surveys. And these are recommendations which, you know, you've heard throughout the presentation is coming very clearly from the parents is that they are looking for intensive catch up involving extra time during the school day, evenings or weekends should be avoided. Rather, mental health and well-being should be prioritised with schools employing a range of strategies to address this, and that's including destigmatizing mental health through frequent discussions in class, regular physical activity for all students, and being innovative with such classes as well. It's not just about being out on the pitch. It could be the daily mile, the samba, the hip hop, the chair exercises at the start of every lesson, and etc. And also focus on activities such as music, art and drama, which provide students with an alternative mechanism to express their feelings and to deal with their emotions. Standardisation of remote teaching um, and online learning to include minimum standards of live online learning and one-to-one -one interactions for all pupils unable to attend school. Because again, in already we know that there are many cohorts of pupils who are learning from home due to isolation. So this is something which really needs to be sorted out as a standardisation of remote teaching. School to home communication has improved for many parents, but we would like to see stronger school to home engagement so that every parent feels valued as a partner in education and is clearly informed. We also join with parents in their call for support for employers to allow greater flexible working conditions for working parents. And we believe that this is needed in order to support homeschooling when it is required. And this is particularly for mothers. And again, um, going on all the feedback from the assessments and what's going through at the moment is that there is a need for clear, achievable goals and timelines must be outlined and adhered to concerning external assessments. So that is us from us, Chair, and we're both very happy now to take 
Any questions? Thanks very much indeed for uh, that comprehensive presentation. Some extremely important data there. Um, I declare an interest as chairperson of the of the all party group on parental participation in education um, and a parent of children in education. I I'm acutely aware of of the importance of the engagement that you uh, both organisations have done with with parents during this pandemic. So I, I thank you for that. Um, I think most of us were acutely aware of the centrality of school to not only children and young people, but wider society. And the pandemic has exposed that even further. Um, I'll go straight into questions from my uh, colleagues, given we're short for time, um, and hope that, as has been said, someone does ask about uh, the impact on parental and guardian mental health and wellbeing to give uh, Dr. John McMullen an opportunity to respond to that. Um, can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Um, thank you, Chair, and um, well, uh, can I thank each of those who are there? And again, Chair, this is a another report that we've had today, which is we could have spent nearly a whole session uh, on this report uh, alone. Um, so I, I, I'll I'll ask the first question, Chair, in in line with what. You've, you've suggested uh, the mental health issues around uh, the parent, parents. But can I add to that then, uh, reference was made to parental confidence. Uh, maybe the two are indeed tied in together. It's notable that uh, the report confirms that uh, in terms of the measurement uh, of parental confidence, 31% were not very confident and 12% not at all confident. You add those two together, that's a significant uh, percentage that will certainly impact upon the learning of, of, of the children. Uh, and then, Chair, maybe uh, to look at, uh, as outlined in, in, we just finished with the recommendations there, um, as outlined in, in our report uh, on page 203, What's the next step forward in the implementation of those recommendations? And, and Chair, those are very much tied in with, I think, the general thinking of the members of the committee in the return to school and the, the need for a whole approach. Well, it says in these one, it says in the recommendations, a whole school approach. I think we would be looking for perhaps a, a more wider than the whole school, but a whole community, whole department, whole statutory approach to the matter. So maybe if I could ask the questions around that, Chair. Thanks for that, Robin. Can I bring in John uh, to start with then? Thanks. Um, yes, I'll, I'll maybe let Noel, uh, after I finish, take on the question about the uh, parent confidence. I mean, uh, I suppose the bottom line is that uh, parents aren't trained teachers and shouldn't be expected to be confident or even competent teachers, but we, we saw a huge um, discrepancy there and uh, we know that lockdown has um, exacerbated disadvantage. It's one of our, our main findings. We hear a lot of people saying that um, that, we're all in the, that we, we were all in the same storm, but um, or, or we're all in the same boat, but yes, we're in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boats. And so, as someone said, some people are in yachts and some people are in dinghies and, and parental experience has has varied hugely. And with regard to um, mental health and, and well-being, um, I mean, it's, a, it's had a huge impact on both studies. You can see that in parents and on kids. Um, and I think most concerningly was how much worse it looked among children, parent reports of their children's well-being compared to the study we did in 2020 compared to 2021. Um, I think it's really important to find a balance here, though, in our, in our language. And I think some of the, the media um, coverage around mental health being, mental health and well-being can run the risk of being a bit fatalistic and kind of cultivating this, a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of this generation of, of children and young people, that it's the COVID generation, that they're uh, wiped out by a tsunami of mental illness. Um, and that's not the case. While we've seen that a lot of children have really struggled, uh, we know from some longitudinal research, 
co-space study in Oxford, for example, that once kids get back to school and get back to the structure and routine and the predictability of school, um, the, a lot of them um, will recover. And f- and we we know that for most kids, and, we, and we're seeing that already, and we're hearing reports from schools. We're, we're out in schools at the minute seeing our students, teachers, um, and we're hearing that lots of kids are doing really well. Um, and getting back to that structure and that routine is going to be, and, and reconnecting with their peers and reconnecting with their teachers is going to be enough um, for, for most kids. But there is definitely concern for, for others. Um, there was already a mental health crisis beforehand, and, that, and that's been exacerbated. And um, I mean, obviously, there, there is, it, it's detailed, you know, what we need, but we need a long term approach. There's been mention of of summer sco- schools around well-being and reconnection, which could be really helpful. But we also really need long term. We need to really trust, respect and, and resource school leaders and, and teachers. Um, First of all, to support well-being, we know that well-being is foundational for academic attainment. There's no dichotomy between learning and well-being. They're, they're deeply connected. Um, a child that is stressed or anxious is not going to be able to learn. But on the other hand, there's loads of research data to show that where well-being is promoted in a school through a whole school approach, um, like the member said there, that that can have really positive impact on acad- academic attainment. Um, and there's lots of good examples out there of recovery curriculums that people have developed to, and, and schools in Northern Ireland here um, embracing that to help kids come back, to help bring those, those healing experiences um, and then helping them to emotionally regulate um, before they educate um, and focusing on catching up with each other and um, catching up with staff um, before the real drive um, towards um, the academic attainment. But on the other hand, they've got these exam pressures, which we're hearing to you, which is just um, exacerbating some of the stuff that we've talked about. So, I mean, there's no simple solutions. They can take more spe- specific questions. Um, and maybe you know, the comment. That, th- thanks for that. Um, did did uh, Dr. Purdy want to come in on the uh, confidence issue? And then I need to keep us moving here as well. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, just very quickly, um, and thanks for your question, Robin. Um, yes, absolutely. As John, as John said, I mean, um, parents are generally not qualified teachers, and uh, levels of confidence um, uh, were often very low, um, particularly with older children. Um, so there was a slight difference there where parents felt a little bit more confident maybe with the curricular areas in primary schools, but in post-primary it was more challenging in terms of subject content as well. But the biggest difference, um, of course, we find the biggest divergence of experience is related to uh, social background of the parents. And that probably comes as no surprise. We find it last year in our survey in April, we find it again this time, that parents who were um, less well qualified educationally, but also those on lower incomes, were those who had the lower uh, lowest levels of confidence. Uh, and we find as well that they generally then um, were less engaged, less directly engaged in supporting their children's learning um, and spent less time doing so as well. And so that's an area of real concern for us. Uh, we find as well, as has been mentioned in the presentation, that there were particular concerns for parents who are working from home and trying to juggle everything. Uh, and that came through in one of the recommendations that Jane mentioned just earlier as well. Um, and a sense, I think this time, I mean, having, having been involved in both studies, but this time around, with this lockdown in January, February, there wasn't the same sense of optimism. And I'm talking about the open-ended comments that we had from parents. I remember reading those from last April and May when the weather was beautiful, when, when we were all enjoying a certain level of you know, being outside with our children um, you know, in the garden and going for walks. And in January and February, when the weather was cold and dreary and dark, um, I think that, that made life much harder. And we heard that from parents of some of the youngest children in our survey as well, um, who had least content being sent through from school, um, but also who had least opportunities to go out and enjoy the fresh air and play outside as they might have done last year. So um, lots of issues and lots of issues related to social background and level of income and educational qualification. Chair, may I just add one thing, please? Yeah, briefly. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I just want to come to Jane Thompson or maybe she would tie this into her then as well, Chair. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Robin, and then we'll bring Jane in. Thank, thanks, Robin. Yeah, she, she's obviously a champion from for Mana. We, we all know that. But in terms of this connectivity, 
Is there much that we can learn from the open university approach to this, uh, what has issued, what has happened over the pandemic? Jim? Okay, thank you, um, Robin. I will actually hand that question straight back to Strand Millis again because we didn't ask about the digital. I was just involved with Jonathan to make sure that we had good enough responses from Fermanagh and Oma so that we were able to communicate through to the council on that. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the, and I think I I really love that you picked up on the point about the large percentage of parents who are lacking confidence in supporting their children's learning. And for the parents who reported to us that they lacked confidence, we asked them what resources or support would they like in place to help improve their confidence. And the first thing, the top thing coming out from that was more online lessons. That was followed by support from school to enable parents garner an understanding of what is being taught and how it is being taught. And that was followed by support from employers. And then it was the, after that was regular feedback from schools providing support and feedback. And then the last one, but by no means least, um, was SEN issues. So um, I'll pass your question, if that's okay, on the digital back over to Strand. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can maybe quickly respond to this. Um, uh, by the Open University uh, approach, I, I was I was part of a meeting um, on Monday, um, organised by the um, the International Public P Policy Observatory, um, which was a COVID nineteen roundtable on, on what we learned about online learning during the pandemic. And there was a representative from the Open University there, um, and it was interesting to hear from them about um, about how they've been. Um, advising uh, various uh, online learning um, groups, uh, particularly in England and Wales. Um, but the key differences, um, obviously their, their background and experience is it's working with adults who want to learn or who want to, who want to do the course. Um, uh, whereas obviously statutory education, um, there's, there's a whole um, need to uh, engage um, children in the first place um, in, in learning that they, they may not, <laughs> if left to their own devices and their own um, uh, wishes wouldn't engage with um, and sticking to a curriculum that, that maybe they wouldn't choose um, and secondly that um, they have a lot of experience with um, with asynchronous learning um, so for flipped learning go away and read this and, and, and write an essay on it and, and, and we'll, we'll exchange via email um, again not so um, uh, appropriate to, to children, um, but there, there is there is a conversation there. There is some collaboration, particularly with with the Oak Academy um, over in England, um, and there's I, I think you're right to suggest that there is there are things that we could learn from the Open University approach. Chair, can it work? Whoever would take the question, really, the implementation of the recommendations. What would be the next step in that? Okay, thanks. I'll make that the final question, Robin. Thanks. Thank you. Who's in? Implementation of the recommendations. No. Okay, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I believe, um, Chair, is that the next step is that when we present to the All Party Group for Parental Participation and Education at the end of the next month, again, of which that we will have parents on that call, is that we discuss with the MLAs as part of the APG of what that we can do together collectively to look at how that we drive forward the, um, you know, the next steps for the recommendation so that it's a collective approach that we're taking um, along with that, you know, with MLAs, with parents and um, with ourselves and Strammelis. Okay. And maybe you'd, you'd, you'd be content for us to write to the Department of Education to seek their uh, response to the findings and the recommendations as well, if that would be useful. Uh, absolutely. And it would be great that if they could attend the APG also and, and we can have that open discussion with them. Okay. Thanks for that. Content with that, Noel? Yeah, that's great. Let me bring Daniel McCross and MLA in. You'll have something to say about internet connectivity in, in, in Oman, Strabahan. Go ahead there. Yeah, I, I, I note we have a solid champion for there, there so well done on, on that. It's certainly a big, big issue uh, that, that needs to be dealt with, and hopefully Project Stratum will alleviate a lot of that pressure when we finally get it rolled out.
Uh, so thank you to you all for your very comprehensive presentations. Uh, I'll just go straight to questions. I've just a number of points. Um, it is apart from the survey that a significant number of parents consistently sought uh, live teaching. Uh, we can appreciate that this would have alleviated several issues, such as the desire for a trained teacher to be leading the learning and the provision of a degree of a degree of peer interaction. Uh, can I ask your opinion uh, on that and uh, whether you believe that the C2K infrastructure could have coped with such a demand for bandwidth, etc.? And technically speaking, was it, uh, is it uh, practically possible? And finally, would there have been uh, the number of devices and homes to enable a family of children to be online at the same time over the period of the school day? Go ahead, Noel. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Daniel, for that. That's a really important question. And the, the issue of live teaching came up last year in our survey and indeed this time as well. And as, as Jonathan noted, um, you know, the far more parents were reporting that their children were in receipt of live teaching this time compared to last time. Um, but it's not a panacea, and I think your question sort of lends to you know um, lends to that as well. That uh, what we don't want, um, uh, if we ever have to go through this again, and let's hope we, we never do, um, is children sitting um, looking at screens all day. Um, and actually, one of my children um, that was his experience uh, on certain days this time around. Certainly not in the first lockdown, but this time around. There were some days when he was sitting literally from nine to three looking at a at a screen and it was live and it was i suppose in some ways more more engaging than having to work on his own but that's not that's not what we want for our children either uh, and of course that raises issues about co rural connectivity that you're very aware of um in, in west Tyrone, um and also the digital poverty question as well but what parents were asking for, and particularly this came through last time, was, was some degree of live teaching, some engagement, because so many more of those parents last time had absolutely no live contact with their teachers. And they were saying that their children missed not just the social interaction with their peers, but actually just missed their teachers, particularly the younger children. Uh, so we're, I don't think we would ever be advocating for a full day sitting in front of a screen for our children. I don't think that's healthy for lots of reasons. Um, but some engagement, the parents seem to be very keen to have some engagement and there appear to be benefits, not just educational benefits, but as John was saying, um, in terms of pastoral support and that, that sort of um, sense that the school was still in communication with them and that there was somebody there asking about their pastoral welfare as well as about their learning needs. Okay. Uh, just in relation to C2K, obviously it's well noted that the current system, uh, in the opinion of many, is no longer fit for purpose. It's 20, year out of date, uh, 20 years old, sorry, uh, and uh, it, it's struggling. A lot of teachers have fed that into us. But what's your view of the current C2K system? Um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm qualified to comment on that, Daniel, but um, what I would say is that there were a range of different platforms that were being used by schools, and we heard parents talk about that. Um, but it generally was, was you know, Google Classroom or uh, one of those other platforms that were being used. C2K actually wasn't one that was being commonly used. So that might, that might suggest that, you know, there is a need for that to be updated. But I, I wouldn't be the best person to, call, to comment on that. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Noah, in, in relation to uh, uh, issues with it. I think the Department and EA are, are hiding in the bushes in relation to it. Uh, it'll need to be addressed. Uh, I'll, I'll go to the next. Thanks for that. No, I'll go to the next question. Uh, the Strand Miller survey also pointed towards an advantage being gained by the children of parents with higher levels of educational attainment. How big do you believe this advantage is, and what <clears throat> public policy or other changes do we need to enable equality of opportunity for our children? Uh, perhaps associated with this is the issue of access uh, to digital devices, which you touched on. Your survey reported only a slight increase in the number of such devices available to children considering the resources the Department of Education has reported it put into combating digital poverty across uh, Northern Ireland. Can you account for the fact that uh, you only report a slight improvement uh, in those figures? And the final point to that question is, I am also concerned to see a significant problem for many parents trying to shuffle uh, home learning with uh, working from home also. Uh, and, and I've heard many reports of the stress that has caused. Do you believe uh, the children of such parents is a new group of children that we ought to have, be concerned about? Well, there was a lot. There was a lot in that question, Daniel. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and several questions all in one. Maybe I'll make a start, but I'm sure Jonathan and Jane and John might want to come in there as well. Um, yes, there has been a, a, a small increase in digital access. Um, but we must remember that our survey, the crew survey at least, was, was socially skewed. 
uh, and we're very conscious of that, that, that you know, parents who don't have access couldn't fill out an online survey, for instance. Um, and in terms of the educational qualifications and income of the parents who completed our survey, it would suggest a more middle class audience than would, would have been demographically representative. So we're very conscious of that. Um, but even within that survey, um, there were a lot of children who, there were very few children who had no access uh, but there were uh, large numbers of children who were sharing devices. And to go back to your last question, you know, that the, there were still only maybe half of the children in the survey who had access to their own digital device. Um, they were either sharing or in, in some cases we heard of children who were waiting for their parents to come back from work so that they could access their mobile phone. And those were, after all, the parents who were digitally connected to fill out this survey. Uh, and we haven't heard, I presume there is, uh, a constituency of parents who didn't have access and therefore couldn't even complete our survey. Uh, I'll bring in Jonathan um, maybe next on that. Okay, yeah. Um, to be honest, no, I, I would have just said what, what you've just said in response to that question. Um, so I don't really have anything to add, so I'll pass over to Jane. Okay, and they, they keep us moving here as well, folks, so keep, we'll keep it concise, thanks. I'm not quite sure, Daniel, what your question was around the children um, of the parents who are juggling work and um, schooling. But what I will say is for the parents who were juggling the work and schooling is the amount of guilt that in particular a number of the frontline workers are consumed with, given that they haven't been able, what in their eyes was to provide the same levels of support to their children learning from home. And they felt that those children were going to be disadvantaged and behind whenever they return yeah. to school again. Yeah, that, that's spot on as to what I intended, yeah. Can I, I, I was going to that. And um, we did try to, on your question about uh, parents, is there a particular group for parents that were working at, at home? We did try to break down the mental health and wellbeing data of parents um, across employment status. And we didn't find any significant difference between parents that were working from home or working outside the home or on furlough. Are not working basically across the board parents were struggling um but we did see some if you break it down a little bit more interesting things like around the early years we found that um there was a significant um benefit um, when kids were playing outside and kids that had more play experiences and more opportunities for outdoor learning were less likely and um, there was less likely to have reported impact on their mental health and well-being and their physical health and well-being and their social skills. So obviously the kids who were getting outside and playing more um, did better. And they're probably the ones whose parents were able to, um, to have the resources and the opportunities to allow them to do that. But we, across the board, all parents were struggling and there were no significant differences, differences whether parents were working at home or not. Okay. Okay, Dan. Yeah, yeah well, I have another question, Chair, but will I get it up? If you're very brief, go ahead. Sure, I'm, I do my best. Do my best. Uh, just uh, on on another uh, uh, front, lockdown. Uh, just specific to lockdown, because this is a big issue. Seems to have impacted negatively in children's social skills, levels, behaviour, and physical health and well being. With the second lockdown being significantly worse than the first, and most people reported that. If I could divert the panel's attention to a different, a different but perhaps connected matter for a moment, the department is going to look at the length of the school day for preschool children with a view of standardising patterns of attendance. And uh, commenting on this, the department has also pointed out that the EPPNI study some years ago concluded that there was no evidence of a cognitive advantage for children in a longer day, but there were other benefits in terms of opportunities for socialism, child development and increased engagement with parents. So with that in mind, in light of what we are learning about the COVID effects on our children um, and our newfound understanding of the well-being benefits of children and young people being together, should we be moving to reduce the length of the school day for any of our preschool children now or in any time in the future? Okay, so our, our preschool hours are already widely varied anyway. Does anybody want to... It's a, it's a really good question. I don't think we've got anywhere near enough time to look at it right now. If, does anyone want to offer a really, really concise response with regards to how many hours per day preschool classes should be? No. Uh, just a very concise uh, response, and that is, Daniel, that there is an inconsistency and an inequity of provision at the moment between part-time and full-time provision in the early years. And I would agree that even though there, there might be conflicting evidence around the cognitive benefits of full-time provision, I think there are many other benefits, social benefits, free school meal benefits, interaction benefits, play benefits, 
which will um, disproportionately benefit children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, and I do think there's an important issue that the department needs to take forward here. Okay. Yeah, well said. That's spot on, though. Thank you. The committee was activated when the EA tried to reduce send nursery hours um, a good few years ago, and the consultation on the early year, this early year send framework is still ongoing. I think despite starting 2018, I'm going to need to move us on. I've got three members left, I believe, and less than 15 minutes available to us. Can I bring, I, hopefully, William Humphrey, MLA, although we are having some audio yeah, issues. Thanks, thanks yeah, I'm sorry about the audio issues earlier. No, no problem. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and I think uh, it, it ties in with some of the points I was making earlier on there with with with. Um, some of our previous uh, guests, um, John, you talked about structure and uh, routine. I think that's that that is hugely important for young people, um, and and I see that in terms of as a governor of school, but also as someone involved in in youth work. Um, you know the difficulties, the problems, and in terms of the psychological well being of our young people and the support structures that schools present, but not just schools. You know, churches, youth organisations, sports clubs, and so on, ha has obviously been missing for some time. So there's, it's 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 it, you know a complete withdrawal from that support structure, rather than the family. And obviously, some family familial support structures are better than others, uh, and that's particularly ac acute in working class and more deprived communities. Um, and it's particularly acute for young people who've got special educational needs, as we know. Um, so. The fears are there; they're they're they're, they're huge. In terms of the, the, I was very interested in the, the point about the intensive catch up um, being avoided, and the, and the issues around mental health and well being, and social, um, and emotional and physical well being, and so on, um, and the whole school approach, as, as it was called. Can I ask for some um, meat on the bones around that, please? Um. We had we had big hopes uh, for meat on the bones coming along with the the emotional health and wellbeing framework that um, the department released and and the mental health uh, strategy um, and and there's there's some good things in that especially maybe more so in the in the implementation plan um, all the evidence shows around mental health and wellbeing in school that it, it has to be a whole school approach that um, it needs to come from the ethos and from the leadership. Um, and an ethos that um, just goes throughout the whole school and is consistent um, through the different classes. Um, but there's also um, a lot of evidence in, in different specific interventions, social and emotional learning interventions. Um, the, they can have a big impact on well-being, but also on academic attainment and lots of other uh, variables as well. And I know there's lots of different organizations and charities that are developing these for schools and presenting these to the, to the department. Um, ultimately, I think um, the people that know our kids best are the teachers and school leaders, and I really feel strongly that we need to uh, trust them, but also resource them. And um, I know, I'm sure it's been presented to your committee many times about there's already a huge deficit in, in funding, and often when there's little bit of funding released like there was um, for mental health, if it's not ring fenced and if there's no guidance around how you use it, it often gets just sucked into the the black hole of the deficits in schools and used to plug gaps, and therefore there's no long term um, uh, planning and resourcing of mental health and wellbeing, and and that's what we need more than anything. We needed it before the pandemic, and we need it even more now. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I think it's important. Early intervention is is more effective, and it's also more cost effective. Um, but I, I think in the short term, if we look at short term and, and then move on to the medium and long term, in the short term, I want to see a greater, my colleague Robin and I have been making this point, I want to see a greater joint upness across government and local government and the statutory agencies working with the voluntary sector to drive uh, the, 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 the issue forward in terms of the um, joined up approach across government and the resource that you've just mentioned being put in place in terms of money on people because... Um, I think that's the only way, really, you get the, the results we want at the end of this, because this, this is a very dangerous time for young people, uh, because in the constituency I represent in, in Greater Shankill and, and North Belfast, 
the number of young people and the wider community who are taking their own lives uh, and, and continue sadly to do so. This is a massive, massive issue and the health and well-being of people is so, so important. Um, and, you know, we, we need even a joined up approach around around the, those organisations that are working in that field as well. Um, so we do, I want to see people being this being galvanised and, and, and coordinated and there being champions to to go out. And I see people like Siobhan O'Neill being key p, p, people in that. And also I have to say as well, um, recently I saw the interview given by Carl Frampton, you know, and the fact that he wants to put back in the community he comes from in Tigers Bay and his wife, I think, um, from from uh, somewhere in, in, in West Belfast Pole Glass or somewhere like that. I, I want to see that sort of champion that those role models because I think those role models will then relate, relate to young people uh, and bring bring us um, to the place we need to get to and more importantly the young people need to get to much more quickly. Chair, I have other questions but I know you're pushed for time so thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. I'll bring Robbie Butler in and hopefully we'll still get to cover some of those other issues there as well. Robbie and, and I know John wants to respond. Robbie? Yep. Okay, thank you, Chair. And um, John, you'll probably get a chance to respond here because we're probably going to ask something in around the same type of question. Um, so much of what has been reported is, is is stark. So what it does is it kind of magnifies some of the stuff that was already known, to be fair. So we know about the link between poor mental health, education and achievement, um, and poverty. Um, but I'm just going to say this to put out front and centre. I want to thank you, John, for some of the statements you've been putting out of late. You, you even uh, covered it earlier on when you said about we need to be careful we don't go into the realms of self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, we don't need to be um, uh, sort of uh, painting a, a gloomy picture uh, for the future of these young people and their families. But I want to also give credit to Parentkind here because we have heard a lot from um, children's advocates. We've heard a lot from educationists and we don't often hear from parents. And we know that parents play a, an incredibly important role with regard to the outcomes of our young people. So with regard to, um, I suppose we covered this in, in the other two sessions, and I think it's only fair, that you will know that this committee and a number of the members on here have, uh, have the, 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 the we, we champion special education needs, we, special, we, we champion disability and, and um, learning disabilities in particular. Um, in terms of the outcomes for those parents, so setting aside that the children have, perhaps have the needs, some of those parents similarly will have needs as well. Some of those parents have disabilities and, and, and special education needs. What is the strategy or, or the ideas for um, coming out of this? Not just in, in times of COVID, but actually in the longer term strategy for um, helping those parents. Um, can I just, uh, thanks Robbie for that and thanks for all your advocacy in this area as well, it's really appreciated. Um, can I just respond uh, to William's final point there and then I'll let one of my colleagues uh, answer the one from Robbie about parents. Um, I totally agree with William and, and think it, he absolutely hit the nail on the head that the key to mental health and wellbeing improvement across um, our country is cross-sector collaboration and integration. Um, I, I'm an education psychologist and, and work with a lot of kids that have been excluded from school for their behaviour and, and working with um, in some of those settings, EOTA settings, teachers were dealing with more severe mental health issues than the kids that were going to CAMS often because a lot of these young people would never go to a one-to-one -one clinical setting and the teachers were literally and, and um, metaphorically bandaging wounds and um, they were dealing with it. Um, there's a loads of research from around the world showing how um, engaging mental health services and support within schools um, can be really beneficial and there's a real need for better collaboration between education and health in this perspective. England, Scotland and Wales, you know, we're doing this 10 years ago and are starting to be putting mental health support teams in schools and designated head for mental health in every school. Um, and. I thought this was lacking personally in the strategy. This was the main thing I put in my consultation and um, spoke to Siobhan O'Neill about it last week. And if there was one thing I think that we need more is more collaboration, more integration, and more working together in between departments around mental health and wellbeing. And maybe Noel wants to comment on 
Uh, if I could just come in quickly about, about SEN, because I'm sure Jane will want to say a lot more, but um, I think it's important that we, we do point out that, that during this um, second period of, of the school closures, actually the special schools stayed open. And I think we need to commend and celebrate the special school principals and staff, uh, teachers and classroom assistants uh, for doing that, because there was a lot of um, fear and anxiety and a lot of pressure actually on special school leaders uh, with staff absences and so on uh, to try and make that happen. And I'm speaking as a parent governor of a special school and, and I really appreciated the fact that special schools were open from January this time. Um, so the first during the first lockdown, of course, that wasn't the case and there were many harrowing um, instances of, of, of parents of children uh, with very complex uh, needs uh, who were very much left to their own devices with the removal of all the therapeutic support as well and respite, which is still not being reinstated. Um, so, so I think before Jane talks about the, the many questions that she asked around this, I think it, we have to celebrate something positive here, and that is that the special schools did stay open. And I know there was a lot of criticism last time around, but they did stay open and they're to be commended for that this time. Here, here. Okay. Um, thank you, Noel. I think that just going back, William, also to what you said, what sprung to my mind immediately was is that old African proverb of where it takes a village to raise a child, you know, and never more um, was that village needed right now. And just as John and Noel have alluded to, that collaborative working between um, communities between, and between schools, but also between the departments. And I would actually go a little bit further than John, and I would say it's not just the Department of Health and the Department of Education that need to work together in greater um, partnership, but it's also the Department for Communities who are providing so many and funding so many of those uh, extracurricular activities for our young people, but also for our parents as well. Because when, you know, sport is one of, of the things, obviously, is that a number of us are drawn to in order to promote positive well-being. And that's not just for children. That's also for, their, for the adults as well. I mean, I always say is that I run to detox my inbox that's why I run it's not because I particularly like running and um, I, I run to detox the inbox and that's the same for many um, other parents as well so by that greater collaboration and access to activities um, externally and also eliminating some of the pressures on parents to juggle homeschooling and um, they're working from home as well it will allow them to more organically regulate themselves I also agree with John as I pointed out during the press presentation is that when we ask parents where do they go for support um, about their child's mental well-being, the, the first door that they're knocking is the door of the school and that is piling huge pressure on the schools. So I think that we need to be careful not to pile any more pressure on the schools, having to also keep an eye on parents' well-being at this stage and that's where we're looking to work in greater collaboration with the with the other departments as well. And um, just in mentioning saying again we know and there are a whole raft of issues there which are impacting on parents psychological well-being whether it's the statementing process whether it's the review whether it's just been listened to in the first um, instance whether it's getting access to the external services and um, such as cams for etc and whether it's also respite for parents so hopefully now you know working together we can start to get those things back into order and that will also will be of great help to the parents. Thanks, Chair. I don't want to be naughty here, guys. I appreciate your answer, but my question actually was not about kids with special educational needs or disabilities. It was about parents that might have that additional difficulty and what can be done to support those parents. So I think some of the members have picked up that, you know, there are some families who have found it hard to support their children through remote learning and that type of stuff. And I'm going to be honest, as a parent, um, who didn't do very well in GCSEs, I found it a struggle to support my children when they came home with you know, homework that needed to be done. So my question actually wasn't about the kids with the additional needs. It was about the parents who had additional needs, perhaps, and what could be done to facilitate. There may be small numbers. I, I, I grant it. Uh, but is there anything in there, Amgen, in particular, that, that, that stands out? I, I can't, um, Robbie, directly answer you that because in our demographics, we didn't ask the parents that if they had a special or additional need, we only asked about their children. So therefore, I don't have the evidence based from this survey to, to give you what I feel is a robust um, answer that I can stand over um, on that. But, um, uh, 
for everybody to look at again. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm happy enough for that, Chair. Thank you guys for the work. The report is very, very good. Uh, I, I re it really is a credit to you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Robbie. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan to finish? Thank you, Chair, and thanks again to all of you for um, attending here this morning. It's been a really, um, really important discussion and lots of information for us to get through there, and lots of topics have already been um, discussed. But, Jean, I've met with you previously a number of times. I've met with different parents, so um, it's really important that we hear um, from parents and the needs that they have so we can make the changes that they need to bring the support in that they need. You know? So I'm really pleased to have you here this morning. Um, on Monday, Sinn Féin brought a motion to the Assembly on academic selection and calling for academic selection to be um, scrapped. And one of the main reasons was because the evidence shows, now the evidence that uh, dictates this, to say that socioeconomic um, status is a key factor in determining the outcome for children um, going through the transfer test. Um, the parent kind survey um, as part of this briefing showed that um, it touches on the same kind of topic. Um, so just wonder if any of you would like to elaborate on the experiences of families from socially deprived backgrounds and how lockdown has affected them. So I'm not asking for uh, maybe a debate on academic selection. Church and Ivy like surely, but um, just how, you know... It's just they, never, they, never, they never answer that question anyway, Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I could maybe make a start. We did, we did ask... Um, our, the parents in our survey about uh, transfer and what we found um, overwhelmingly was uh, that, that the parents of P7 children uh, thought that there ought to have been a solution uh, with alternative arrangements uh, much, much earlier in the year. So they were very concerned and we find that the, 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 the wealthier parents, if you like, were more concerned about grammar school issues and would their child get to the grammar school under the alternative arrangements and so on. But setting that aside for a moment, um, the, the main issue I think that came through from those P7 parents was that they were concerned that this, this year had been um, you know, tumultuous for their children. There'd been ups and downs and uh, they were never sure quite what was going to happen. And they just, there was an overwhelming sense. I mean, three quarters or you know, two thirds of the parents, I think, uh, who said that really uh, the, the decisions needed to have been made earlier in the year. What we also heard then was from the parents of children in the current P6 who are looking ahead uh, and are faced with the same uncertainty. Remember our survey was carried out in mid-February before any schools had decided to abandon academic selection for next year. Uh, so there was a lot of concern again right across the board about uh, what's going to happen. Are we going to just go back to uh, academic selection again for all schools in the year, year ahead? And how would their children who had missed, what, six months really of face-to-face -face teaching in the last 12, uh, how they would be disadvantaged by the current system? So those are very real concerns uh, that were being um, expressed by, by all of our parents, by a lot of our parents. Yeah, they are very real concerns, Noel, and I suppose, just as you pointed out, your survey was back in February and we're still we're back to the same way we were last year where we're calling and Minister to try to make these decisions instead schools are having to come out in front of him and do that there and it's, it's really not good enough because as much as it adds uh, stress and anxiety to children, it also does that to the parents as well, so again, we'll be calling for the same kind of measures. But thanks very much for that and thanks everybody for um, your evidence here this morning. Thanks. Thanks for that. The, 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 it, it's sometimes lost for some unknown reason, but the Assembly actually voted uh, to call on the Minister to bring forward contingency arrangements in November last year. Um, so that, you know, that was a pretty clear will of the Assembly. But um, let's hope um, we get urgent clarity for this year's P6s who are going into that process next year as soon as possible. Folks, time has beaten us. Um, but thank you so much indeed um, for uh, such informative engagement today. Uh, and as Jane said, hopefully there are other ways to continue this in engagement in, in due course. Um, do you like to make any closing comments or are you content with the wide range of issues we've covered there today? Yeah, okay. Th thanks so much for your time, folks. And we look forward to continuing to engage with you. And as I said, um, write to the department to seek its response to the, the important findings and recommendations that your work has made. Thank you.
Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if I can ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all witnesses and to add members back into the spotlight and ask the clerk to summarise any... Sure, sure before you do that, can, can I be, um, just record my apologies? I have to head on. Is that okay? Okay, William, thank you. I'll try and retain um, everyone else then to keep our quorum and to get through these last sure. items. Please. Sure, I, I'm in exactly the same position. I have to... Okay. Go on to another meeting now, so my apologies. I'm just typing a message to you, but... Yeah. Could, uh, could we okay to agree to write to the department um, to seek a response to that those recommendations, members? Yep. Agreed? Yeah, right. yeah. Right. 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 Okay, that's great. Clark, um, I may have lost the core upon you for correspondence here. <laughs> okay. Um, it's um, to go there for a second. Um, yeah, go um, ahead. Um, I response. Um, yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, just on the uh, previous item, um, the suggestion was that the committee should consider bringing young people in more often. Um, so I think we can address that in planning. Um, yeah, great. To ask the department to listen back to the meeting and schedule an update on what they're doing in youth engagement work. And also yeah. I think we sh um, should invite the Youth Assembly um, to give us uh, a presentation on what's happening there. Um, so long term for the... For the can I just ask, is the clerk suggesting that we invite the education service from the Youth Assembly to give us an update? Yeah. And yes, I am. Yeah, I think, think that's an excellent idea, Chair. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, and the other thing is that um, there's been a lot of interest in our meeting today and members, the, the research documents that were provided to you yesterday and the note of the informal meeting that I provided to you um, for today's um, meeting. Is it okay to share those with uh, the media? Yeah, as long as, long as Rays are content with that, I think um, Rays would just check with the recipient of the of the papers and then make them public. Um, so given that we're the recipient, I think we're content to make that public, yeah. Yeah, um, so as long as the committee's happy for that um, to be reflected as well. Okay, okay. Clark. I am, am I right in saying that we can't discharge correspondence with only four of us here? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Okay. Um, if if any of it is uh, in urgent need of agreement prior to next uh, Wednesday's meeting, um, perhaps we could try and reconvene um, in the next few days just for a, a short informal meeting even just to discharge the correspondence but if you and i connect offline we'll decide what the best course of action for that is yeah the other option is to um for me to write to members and ask them to do it under standing order six um 105 and 106 i think it's 115 116. Yeah, um, that might be that might be best yeah that might be, yeah okay Chair, can I just yes, a, um well, i appreciate there was um quite important discussion today uh, and I know I've said this in the past three is just too much for a committee session it's okay. losing focus on uh, the scrutiny element of what we're trying to achieve Like I, I don't feel we had enough time with the department which is where the real scrutiny should be whilst the presentations of the others and the insight is absolutely important particularly in the times run I just feel that the department got off quite lightly today um, like there's an entire element that I couldn't get touched on uh, because of the narrow window we had. And I appreciate we have a lot uh, in our Fordbrook programme and everything else, but three is just far too many for this session. Yeah, no, it's 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 extremely rare that, that we have to schedule three, sometimes the budgetary time scales require to do that. However, as I said, I, I agree with you. Perhaps one solution is for us to invite the department back um, for a follow-up session in, in regard to the budget. Yeah, so, the committee did agree that um, when we still had quorum after the budget session to we ask did. more questions and to re-invite them. So. We, we did. We did. Okay. Um, so, members, in, informally, the next meeting is at 9 a.m. next Wednesday, the, the 5th of May, and we will uh, deal with those actions um, as, as necessary by way of, of written correspondence. Okay, members, Clark, well, Content to adjourn the meeting then, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, the yeah. meeting doesn't adjourn, members. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thanks, bye.